All right, we're going to do a do-over. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good, morning. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Chaim Deitch. I'm the chair of the Veterans Committee. I would like to thank uh, you all for being here today for our joint oversight hearing with the Committee on Higher Education on Veterans and Access to Higher Education. I would like to thank uh, Chair Barron for co-chairing this hearing today, and I would like to extend my warmest regards to the veterans who have joined us this morning. And I really want to say that um, to thank everyone for being here, uh, for taking uh, of your time and uh, joining us at uh, every single uh, veterans hearing. And it's, it's really important uh, for the city, for our veterans, and so I want to thank you for your service. Um, for decades, educational benefits following the completion of military service has been a major incentive for those who chose to serve. The GI Bill, which provides stipends and living expenses for veterans attending college or trade schools, allowing 7.8 million of the 60 million returning World War II veterans to participate in education of training pro or training program. The GI Bill has been subsequ subsequently revised and expanded in 1952, 1966, 1984, 2008, and 2017 with the enactment of post 9-11 GI Bill and the Forever GI Bill. This legislation enhances the educational benefits for individuals who served an active duty in the armed forces on or September 11th of 2001. Qualifying service members can receive as much as 100% of tuition equivalent to the cost of the most expensive public school in the state, as well as 15 years of eligibility for benefits and housing stipend. Unfortunately, our student veterans face and continue to face challenges from the federal government in receiving these benefits on time. GI Bill payments are frequently delayed, and as a result, student veterans are left to find their own tuition and housing, even when they are not able. Many of these veterans face enormous financial strain and even eviction and potential homelessness when the GI Bill does not get paid on time. It is our duty to make sure that our veterans are taken care of in New York City, even when they are not receiving proper help from the federal government on time. Furthermore, there are more than 3,200 veterans who are currently enrolled at the 25 CUNY campuses, span spanning every branch of the armed forces and every academic concentration. Our primary objective today is to ensure that those individuals are receiving customized, individualized advising that meets their unique skill set and life experience, and they are supported throughout their education, that the CUNY's coordination with partners in the non-for-profits and private sectors is as smooth as possible. Finally, we'll also be hearing a piece of legislation, Intro 1047, sponsored by our public advocates, who unfortunately cannot be here today, this bill would require the Department of Veterans Services to provide outreach and education to veterans about issues related to higher education, including how to minimize student debt, student loan repayment options, and lower cost alternatives for, uh, to for-profit higher education. Uh, a rigorous education is the foundation stone of a long and rewarded career. Since our nation's beginning, Americans have supported returning uh, service members in the efforts to, re to, to, uh, to, to bring them into civilian life and expand their careers in new and exciting directions. It is my hope that today's legislation reinforces this, tra this tradi uh, tradition. Uh, I would like to thank uh, committee staff, Council Nuzat Sudri, uh, policy analyst Michael Kurtz, finance an analyst Zachary Harris, and my legislative director, of course, who's just got married about five weeks ago, Tova Chasanoff. Uh, for their work in making this hearing possible. Finally, uh, I would like to recognize my, uh, the committee members who have joined us today, um, uh, Council Member Bob Holden, Council Member Alan Maisel, and Council Member Ben Kalos. So thank you for joining. I just want to, uh, before I give this over to my co-chair, I just want to um, announce that uh, we, recent, we recently had a roundtable uh, with all the funded non-for-profits uh, who received from the 2.3 million um, uh, city council initiatives. And it was really a um, really um, the dialogue uh, during that roundtable was really open and productive, where every uh, all the non-for-profits really got to know each other. So this way, when a veteran approaches one non-for-profit who um, doesn't do the services that that veteran um, came in for it, then they could just refer them to the other one, to the, to the other non-for-profit who does that. So everyone really got to meet each other. 
Um, here in the City Council, we also put together a uh, book. It's uh, the Veterans Resource Guide, and this is strictly with all the non-for-profits who receive funding, so this way everyone's held account accountable to provide those services. Uh, we will be having uh, another roundtable with the non-for-profits who we will, be, we will be inviting advocates uh, to those meetings, so this way everyone gets to know each other. And in addition to that, um, I have spoken to Commissioner Sutton. Uh, we'll, we'll also be having a roundtable with advocates with uh, the staff of DVS, so this way all advocates get to know each uh, staff member uh, within DVS personally, and they uh, will know exactly who to, who to reach out for, uh, to, to reach out to in case services are needed. Uh, different staff members provide different services, and we all need to get to know each other. This way we could better uh, work closely together to provide these services to our veterans. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to turn over uh, the floor to my co-chair, Councilmember Barron. Um, and as Barron, it's a pleasure to have my first um, joint hearing with you. And she is my neighbor on the 18th floor, so we know what we share the same wall, so we get to hear <laughs> what, what each other's talking, you know, what we talk about. So uh, I got to know her very well over the last year. Thank you, Councilmember Deutsch. Good morning, everyone. I'm Councilmember Inez Barron, and I have the distinction of being the chair of the Committee on Higher Education. I want to thank everyone who is here at today's oversight hearing on veterans and access to higher education, and especially all of the veterans who are here today. It is only fair that your government recognizes your service and serves you in return. So thank you for attending this very important hearing. The committees are looking forward to hearing your testimony, and I encourage every student veteran to testify. We are listening. Before I get to the topic at hand, I would be remiss if I did not first express my disappointment in the op-ed published in the Daily News last month in which Interim Chancellor Vita Rabinowitz and Board of Trustees Chair Bill Thompson called CUNY a lead partner in Amazon's expansion in Long Island City, steps from LaGuardia Community College, and not much further from CUNY's law school. As many of you are aware, Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio collaborated behind closed doors to allow Amazon to bypass local land use review by the city council and establish a so-called HQ2. As part of the sweetheart deal, Amazon, which is the world's richest company valued at $1 trillion with a T, is being provided with $3 billion with a B in incentives. This is offensive. It is offensive to, Long, to LaGuardia Community College and CUNY students who struggle to pay tuition fees, basic living expenses such as housing, food, and metro cards in order to earn a degree at a university that is in a dangerous state of decay and disrepair. It is offensive to CUNY faculty and students, many of whom are not earning a living wage. It is offensive to New Yorkers. How can CUNY's administration promise to, quote, commit considerable college assets to ensure that Amazon has a strong pipeline for talent, ideas, and innovation when billions in state dollars are just handed over to a company where the university is being starved of funds? Indeed, it was only two years ago when the governor threatened to reduce state funding to CUNY by 30% by shifting $485 million of senior college operating expenses and debt service costs to the city. I'm forced to ask, where are the incentives for our students? Who's looking out for them? There are some, and I'm one of those, and I can go on and point about this issue, but it's a transition to discuss veteran students at CUNY, and not also CUNY schools, and discuss the challenges they face with access to higher education. We recognize the intrinsic value of higher education from skill development to career opportunities and lifetime earnings. A post-secondary degree is essential to surviving and thriving in our current economy. A CUNY degree has proven to increase one's social mobility, which is in line with the university's mission to propel the disadvantaged into the middle class. 
This is particularly relevant for veterans who risk their lives defending the American dream yet frequently find themselves at a significant disadvantage when potential employees view their military experience as non-transferable to a civilian workplace. This is, disturb this is a disturbing fact that has been identified as a contributing factor to our nation's homeless veteran population. Some 11% of the adult homeless population are veterans. And of this number, roughly 45% are African American or Hispanic. Despite accounting for roughly 10% and 3.5% of the US veteran population respectively. Many of these homeless veteran, veterans reside in New York City, which is home to approximately 210,000 veterans, service members, and their families, as per DVS's website. Adding to this clear discrimination veterans of color face and an overall lack of appreciation for their military experience in civilian workplaces, veterans also experience high rates of post-traumatic stress and addiction. In short, veterans both need and deserve our support. I want to acknowledge CUNY for the outreach and support it provides to the approximately 3,350 student veterans and military personnel currently enrolled in its programs. It has been just over two years since we last joined the Committee on Veterans for a hearing on veterans in the CUNY system. At that hearing, we heard from a number of veteran students about positive aspects of their college career and learned of some disturbing complaints. At this hearing, I want to have an update on issues raised at our last hearing and to learn about the current work of the CUNY Task Force on Veteran Affairs. I'm also interested in hearing from veteran students at other schools in the city, as well as how those students serve their veteran student populations. In particular, I'm very interested about students' experiences in the Forever GI Bill and how schools are accommodating those who have been affected by the delayed and miscalculated benefit pro payments. I want to acknowledge colleagues from the Higher Education Committee, uh, <coughs> Council Member Holden, who's already been acknowledged, and uh, I want to thank my Chief of Staff, Joy Simmons. We want to thank uh, my CUNY liaison and Director of Legislation, M. Indigo Washington, Chloe Rivera, the, community, the committee's policy analyst, Paul Senegal, counsel to the committee, and Yarev Shavit, the committee's fin finance analyst. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask the council now to swear in our panel. Thank you, Commissioner, for coming this morning. Thank you. Okay. Please raise your right hand, uh, both of you. Yeah. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Good morning, Chair Good morning. Deitch, Chair Barron, members of the New York City Committee on Veterans, as well as members of the New York City Committee on Higher Education. Uh, I'd like to join the chairs in thanking everyone for being here this morning. As I look around the room, I see old friends, new friends, friends I haven't met yet, but in particular, I see veteran advocates, uh, members of our veteran service organizations, uh, members of our Veteran Advisory Board, members of Team DVS, and in particular, our, our partners in education here in the city, uh, Vice Chancellor Rosa, as well as the members of uh, the, the CUNY family. I see uh, Medgar Evers, BMCC, uh, uh, just to name a few, um, Lehman College, as well as uh, I see Dean Ahn over there hiding behind the pillar, who was really the founding pioneer at Columbia's Center for veteran uh, transition and integration. So we are really joined by a great gang of folks here. Thanks to everyone for being here. My name is Lori Sutton. I'm honored to serve as the founding commissioner of the city, New York City Department of Veteran Services. I'm joined today by Cassandra Alvarez, our senior advisor and director of public-private partnerships. Navigating the myriad agencies, providers, and associated regulations and processes can be one of the biggest challenges for a veteran in accessing services, particularly veterans newly transitioning out of military service. At DVS, we strive to take the frustrations, hassles, and trial and error out of navigation. We do this through community engagement, targeted advocacy, and compassionate service from outreach and employment assistance to facilitating peer mentoring and whole health services to veteran homelessness reduction. DVS staff members work with veterans one-on-one -on -one to help them figure out what benefits they might be eligible for and how to gain access to those services. 
I am pleased to present testimony today on how DVS uses this model to promote veteran access to higher education and how our processes relate to the aims of proposed introduction number 1047. Our, home is, our city is home to over 210,000 veterans who come from all walks of life, faiths, backgrounds, races, ethnicities, and eras of service. Of this population in 2016, there were roughly 12,000 student veterans and their spouses and family members currently utilizing their post 9-11 GI Bill educational benefits to fulfill their next mission of personal and professional development at New York City's colleges, universities, trade schools, and job training programs. When an eligible student veteran enrolls in college, the post 9-11 GI Bill pays for 36 months of education at Department of Defense approved institutions of higher education or on the job career training programs. For those pursuing higher education, the post 9-11 GI Bill pays the cost of school tuition directly while simultaneously sending a stipend earmarked for living expenses to the student veteran called the Basic Allowance for Housing, BAH, for as long as the student is enrolled in classes. The average BAH for New York City ranges from $2,800 to $4,100 per month and is meant to cover cost of living according to the zip code of the school the veteran or family member attends. Recently, when the federal government fell behind on delivering the GI Bill benefits that many of our student veterans rely on as their sole means to pay rent, DVS and the Department of Social Services stepped in to provide emergency rent arrears assistance. If a student veteran has fallen behind on rent and is at risk of facing eviction, they can seek immediate assistance by visiting the New York City Department of Social Services Michael J. Handy Veteran Service Center located at 25 Chapel Street in Brooklyn to have their case evaluated for emergency rent arrears funds and other benefits. In addition, DVS and DSS partnered together to create an official letter that student veterans can take to their landlords to validate the delayed GI Bill payments as a legitimate cause for late rent payments. In 2017, to in 2017, DVS and the New York City Commission on Human Rights partnered on an educational campaign to apprise the city's student veteran and landlord communities of the GI Bill as a legitimate source of income, which can be used towards housing costs. Of the city's 12,000 student veterans and family members using the GI Bill, approximately 3,400 attend college at the City University of New York, or CUNY. These veterans can avail themselves of resources such as educational benefits and entitlements, counseling, advocacy resources, mentoring and internship programs, and support resources for them and their families offered through the CUNY Office of Veterans Affairs, led by Lisa Biate here today as well. For those student veterans who wish to speak one-on-one -on -one with a peer about how to navigate campus life, information about veteran campus representatives is available through COVA's page on the CUNY website or by calling or emailing and contacting the CUNY Central Office. In addition to COVA provided resources, the Project for Return and Opportunity in Veterans Education, or the PROVE program, offered at 10 of the 25 CUNY campuses, offers support systems comprised of social work interns, peer student veteran mentors, and field instructors to promote successful ease of transition into college life for student veterans. Meanwhile, CUNY's Accelerated Study in Associate Programs, ASAP, assists students earning associate degrees within three years of academic study with financial, academic, and personal support such as career counseling, tutoring, fee and tuition waivers, MTA Metro cards, and financial assistance to assist with purchasing textbooks. For those not attending CUNY, student veteran-specific resources are also generally available at private colleges and universities. For example, Columbia University School of General Studies offers financial aid, VA benefits counseling, information on scholarships available to veterans and their family members, as well as a university studies program free to all transitioning vets, regardless of where they attend school. This is performed through Columbia's new Center for Veterans Transition and Military Integration. Manhattan College has a special Veterans at Ease holistic health retreat program designed to help student veterans manage stress and successfully transition from the military to civilian and academic life with other student veterans on campus. 
In addition, Fordham University offers robust programming for student veterans ranging from internship placement services to on-campus student veteran community building activities through the Fordham Ram Vets Association. New York University offers the Military Alliance Community Center for undergraduate and graduate student veterans to connect with other veteran and military connected students, as well as other student veteran clubs, groups, and programming in collaboration with entities such as the Student Veterans of America. DVS partners with the College Board, whose college level examination program, or CLEP, helps student veterans expedite their degree attainment through exams that offer college credit based on military knowledge, experience, and independent study. CLEP also gives student veterans the ability to maximize their GI Bill, allowing many to put remaining benefits towards postgraduate degree studies. At DVS, we have created Veterans on Campus, an initiative that brings together the city's colleges and universities and private sector organizations. The objectives of Veterans on Campus are one, to assist academic institutions in identifying and adopting best practices that create a supportive student veteran experience. Two, to inspire new transitioning service members and their families to pursue their higher education goals here in New York City. Three, to ensure successful transition to not only college and community life and educational achievement, but to viable new careers and purpose-driven civilian lives. Over the past year, DVS met with school leadership from a sampling of New York City colleges and universities with high student veteran populations to introduce the agency as a resource and to gauge best practices for promoting academic success. The department issues a student veteran welcome packet which includes information on transitions, services, mentoring, employment, financial literacy, and volunteering to aid student veterans with opportunities to advance personally and professionally. DVS also partners with the aforementioned Student Veterans of America, a leading national organization that serves as the umbrella over many campus-based student veteran organizations. Their advocacy and policy efforts led to passage of the post-9-11 GI Bill legislation, and as we continue to make our Veterans on Campus initiative more robust, we will work alongside SVA to gain data-based insights to help inform programmatic next steps. SVA also offers a useful self-assessment tool in partnership with the College Factual that helps students make the right choice when selecting an institution of higher learning. In January of 2019, DVS will issue a Keys to Success list that will encourage institutions to adopt some of the best practices being implemented to support student veterans and their families throughout the city. The department also facilitates networking events, panel discussions, and career networking events for student veterans and their family members looking to advance their education outside of the classroom. DVS also sought to gain a deeper understanding of the transition experience for returning members moving to New York City through a coordinated research effort. Through focus group sessions and an online survey, DVS reached out to and engaged with students from institutions across the city to understand motivations for moving to New York City for school, future career aspirations, in addition to gauging the most common challenges experienced throughout the transition process in relation to securing housing and navigating federal, state, and local benefits. The information gained from this endeavor is not an exhaustive account of the veteran student experience, but rather an, an introduction to the key challenges and opportunities for further design and development. Ultimately, this information will be used to inform future veterans on campus programming and to leverage resources in the public and private sectors to improve service delivery for transitioning veteran students. This agency consistently looks for novel ways to coordinate and improve service delivery for our veterans and their families, especially those looking to complement their military education with higher learning at one of our city's fine public or private institutions. On Veterans Day, the mayor announced that DVS has launched Vet Connect NYC, a coordinated care network with the goal of ensuring that every veteran and family member gets access to the services they have earned and need to lead fulfilling and purpose-driven lives. A few of the many partners in the Vet Connect NYC network include CUNY, Workforce One, Columbia University, Headstrong Project, VA and the Vet Centers, New York University, The Mission Continues, and the Federal VA. In regards to proposed introduction number 1047, as mentioned publicly when the bill was introduced by the public advocate, soon to be state attorney general earlier this year, 
we support partnering with other governmental and student veteran stakeholders in promoting veterans being more financially literate and utilizing their GI benefits wisely. Credible established providers who are knowledgeable in the space of advising student veterans on how to properly use their available financial resources, especially towards accredited and established institutions, which will help them propel to the next phase in their personal and professional development, is an invaluable asset for our student veteran population. The goals of financial counseling and college advising proposed by Intro 1074 would not be best facilitated or directed by DVS, rather the current system DVS utilizes, as I've described, does accomplish the goal of pairing veterans with entities who are knowledgeable on the important nuances of financially advising student veterans. DVS currently provides information to student veterans about resources for, for example, financial literacy, such as those available through the Department of Consumer Affairs Financial Empowerment Network in addition to its extensive resources on tips for existing student loans, student debt loan clinics, agency reports such as those on student loan distress in collaboration with the Federal Reserve, as well as information on established entities such as the Federal VA and Students, of veteran, student veterans of America, which counsel student veterans on how to correctly apply educational benefits. In addition, if at any time a student veteran feels as if they have been the victim of discriminatory or predatory practices by any educational institution, as well as landlords, employers, or any other potential bad actor, we urge them to contact DVS so that we can connect them to appropriate avenues of recourse, either through city resources or through our network of skilled legal service providers. Veterans and their families, as we've said so many times before, they remain our city's leading natural renewable resource. And DVS welcomes the opportunity to cultivate existing partnerships and grow new relationships with educational institutions who understand the tremendous potential and strength of our student, veteran, and family member population. Thank you again for this opportunity to meet with you today. At this time, I am happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so I see you're here with uh, Cassandra. Um, I just want to ask you, um, what is your role in DVS as a senior advisor and director of public-private partnership, and how do you how, how do you play into uh, working with uh, with the community colleges? Mm -hmm. So I play the role of connector at DVS. Um, as many of you know, uh, many city agencies throughout the city uh, partner with private partners to help make our efforts more robust and make our reach further. Um, and so I work with uh, our Veterans on Campus initiative to ensure that our agency has strong relationships with the schools throughout New York City that have particularly high student veteran populations. So, uh, so who, in, who in DVS works directly with the, the schools? Uh, so I work directly with the schools as far as managing the relationships. Um, I have great relationships with folks in this room today. Um, and as far as working directly with the students, sometimes students will reach out to me because they're familiar with my name or they've gotten my business card at a networking event. Um, and our uh, outreach team also works directly with student veterans. Oftentimes they will table at campus events to ensure that uh, those communities are aware of DVS, the existence of our agency, and the resources we provide. So you're the one who works directly with, uh, with CUNY? So it's, that's your role, or do you have someone under you that... So I, that? I work directly with the um, points of contact at the CUNY institutions, uh, and, and that's not uh, all of them, but um, I have relationships with um, the uh, individuals who are the points on student veteran affairs at those institutions. So if someone calls DVS, so they would connect um, to you? Yeah, absolutely. And then you're the one that would... Yeah, and, 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 and based on the request, um, I'll play air traffic control and, and refer them to another colleague who's best positioned to answer that question, or um, I, will, I will facilitate directly, if appropriate. Just to provide a little context, over the, this first year of the Veterans on Campus program, uh, our intent was to uh, provide a sampling of our higher educational institutions. So uh, while we have not yet uh, 
uh, visited all of the CUNY, CUNY institutions, mm -hmm. as Cassandra has said. We've visited about half of them, and we work closely with uh, both Vice Chancellor Rosa and Director Lisa Biate for any questions that come up throughout the CUNY system, and we look forward to broadening that reach as we go forward. Also, when the VA issue came up earlier this year, although we had not you know, visited the over 80 uh, institutions, we've visited about 20, between 20 and 25, 25 now in our first year, we did have access to the student veteran coordinators at each of those institutions, and then we were able, as a partnership with our communications and press secretary, Alexis Wachowski and Eric Henry, we were able to quickly make contact with those educational institutions and determine that yes, this was an issue that was affecting many of our student veterans and their family members and we needed to act quickly to do something that would be there in the breach to help, help them, uh, help prevent them from being evicted from their apartments. Interestingly, uh, Chair Deitch, um, just about that same time period, this was uh, just after Veterans Day, the College Board hosted a meeting in Washington, D.C., and I was invited to speak there. And at that meeting, there was a student veteran from Massachusetts who cornered me in the hallway and said, ma'am, do you have any idea what that memorandum, that communication has meant to student veterans in New York City? He says, through my social uh, network, he says, I know of at least a hundred student veterans in New York City who were starting to pack their household goods because they thought they had no recourse other than to move out and stop their education because they did not receive their VH payments. So I think it's a real affirmation of the role that this new agency, the Department of Veteran Services, can provide, and it's a great partnership in working with the committee, and now committees, uh, so nice to have you, Chair Barron, and your expertise with higher education as well. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, VetConnect NYC, um, does VetConnect track all the inquiries that go through VetConnect, like if someone, um, if a veteran should go into VetConnect, inquire about s certain services, does it give you the information of how many inquiries and on what categories? Yes, so we have just, as you know, launched uh, this new chapter of the uh, used to be uh, NY Serves. Uh, uh, network and now VetConnect NYC, and we are now working closely to be able to mesh our data uh, collection systems with theirs, but absolutely, uh, the, the beauty of this system is that we will have such a greater degree of specificity and granularity about the types of services individuals are requesting, and then how those referrals go, what the experience has actually been like. So I look forward in the new year as we continue down this road to be able to update you and the committee on where we are with that uh, process. It's very exciting. Great. Okay. I'm looking forward to that. Um, you mentioned in your testimony that there's a, uh, there's a letter that is given out to the students who can take to the landlords. Yes. Right? So um, does what does that letter do? So you give that letter to the veteran. Yes. What so difference does that let well, make this two. came out of our experience really going back as far as three uh, or even four years ago, uh, student veterans and our student veteran coordinators and, uh, you know, our institutional uh, partners and, and academic uh, uh, leaders were telling us that this was what their student veterans, users of the GI Bill, which of course includes spouses and family members, that they were coming up against this. And so we then, you know, we looked into the issue and we decided that the most direct way of addressing this would be to have something on city letterhead that is official that student veterans, users of the GI Bill, as well as academic institutions could have and present to landlords. Now, our experience has been, for the most part, it's been a matter of ignorance. It's a matter of, 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 of informing landlords. And once they know the law and they know what they're required to do, they do it. But that also then led to our efforts, again, working with uh, our veteran service organization partners, such as the Veterans Alliance and IAVA and the Public Advocate and this committee and others, uh, to work with the Human Rights Commission and to add veterans as a protected class to the city's human rights law. 
And that now gives us kind of a twofold uh, strategy. We both have the information up front that any student veteran or user of the GI Bill can download from our website and take to the landlord. But in the event that that landlord, even given that information, refuses to do the right thing, then that student veteran or GI Bill user has recourse at the city level. We're very excited about that. It's an important message, I think, that not only does the federal government, through the USERRA laws, they've got our, vet, our student veterans' backs, the state has protections, but this is a way of New York City telling our veterans and their families, we, your city, your hometown, your community and neighborhood, we have your back. So uh, what has been uh, DVS's experience since the delays uh, in, in regards to this? Um, like how many people came back, how many people um, called DVS, and how, how large is the issue right now? We think that there are still approximately 3,000 student veterans and their family members, GI Bill users, who are at risk in the city. What we have found since we issued the uh, memorandum a little over a month ago now, we found that actually very few veterans have had to uh, utilize the, the rent eviction uh, mechanism. We think that much like our experience with the BAH and the income uh, provision that we had issued the initial uh, memorandum a couple of years earlier, we think that just the, the publicity of distributing that memorandum and educating our landlords and our students that one, this was a federal glitch, this was not the fault or the, the inaction or the irresponsibility of a given GI Bill user, we, we have reason to believe that that in itself has exercised a protective impact. So we're very um, proud of this. We've been consulted by other cities across the country who have asked what have we done and how can they replicate what we have done to provide that backstop at the city level and we're proud to share our experience in any way we possibly can. Every student veteran and their family member de deserves to study in the confidence and security of knowing that they have a, a roof over their head and that their uh, livelihood and their family's livelihood will not be put at risk. How do we get the number 3,000? We get the number of 3,000 because the, the primary population of veterans that's being affected are the new entrants, the new enrollees. And so it's admittedly, it's an estimate, uh, but in talking with our student veteran uh, coordinators across the network of campuses in the city, that's our best estimate at what it is th that we're looking at at an at-risk population. Potentially any of our 12,000 GI Bill users could be at risk, but that's why we widely spread uh, and disseminated that memorandum, which was picked up, you may have uh, seen the coverage, NBC News did a national news report on it, NPR, it was really great coverage of this to be able to get the news out, not only to our New York City veterans and their family members, but as I said, well beyond. Uh -huh. So do we have information on the thou the, those 3,000, that's, uh, it's, it's just a number, right? Uh, do, we have, do we have like contact information, do we, do we know uh, like, let's say the 12,000 veterans, do we have like information on them that if a mailing or to contact each person? So the most efficient way that we have um, designed our communication is to be in contact with each institution's student veteran coordinator. And through the student veteran coordinator, who of course has access to all of the student's personal information, they can get the information out. We do not send information out directly to those 12,000 students. We, we want those students to hear from their student veteran coordinators uh, about what, whatever issues are germane to their, their uh, educational experience. So the campuses would send out a, uh, a mailing to their student veterans? Is that how it works? Yeah, so, so in, the, in the instance of this most recent, a uh, little over a month ago with the GI Bill uh, BAH funding glitch, uh, our student veteran coordinators widely disseminated that information both through email as well as websites, of course on our website and then the national news coverage in any way we possibly could get the word out. We have continued to encourage folks to spread the word. Okay, would all 12,000 students directly get a mailing from the campuses as far as you know? 
As far as we know, the, the uh, student veteran coordinators send that information forward and then one would assume that the 12,000 uh, student veteran population who are connected to the student veteran population okay. would then get that information, absolutely. Is there any way to like um, make sure that they get it? Like you know, you said you, you're assuming that they're getting it. So Cassandra, is there something that VVS does to follow up with the campuses to make sure that um, the collaborations there and that, that these 12,000 students receive that information? Yes, absolutely. And as I mentioned, we have an open dialogue with most campuses that have large student veteran populations, so they're always uh, able to reach out to me directly as well. So all 12,000 received a notice um, saying that if they need help uh, or if they need a letter from BVS, we are there for you to, uh, to get you through this. Chair Deitch, we sent the information to each student veteran coordinator and their responsibility then is to disseminate that among their student mm -hmm. veteran population. So the coordinator of BBS? No, no, the, 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 the school student veteran coordinator. Is there follow-up after that? To and make then the follow-up becomes... Uh, yes, yeah, so that's what I'm asking, is there, what's the follow-up after that? After you reach out to the, um, to the, to the coordinator in each campus, What's the follow-up after that to ensure that um, something was done? So we've sent the information multiple times, actually. It was in our newsletter. We've sent it out over social media. Um, and again, I have actually called a few of the schools to check in on them to see um, how things are going, specifically the schools with the largest populations. Um, I have an open dialogue with Fordham, with BMCC, um, the schools that have, again, the biggest population. So I was just on the phone with a few of those schools last night. Okay. I, I just want to make sure that the 25, especially 25 uh, community uh, campuses, that um, there is a follow-up to make sure yeah. that and each uh, and every student yeah. receives. And we, we I, I know in CUNY, I think there's like 3,400, but there's 12,000 yeah. um, total. There's 3,400 yeah. in CUNY. Yeah. And we so work closely with Lisa Beata as well. Um, we actually hosted our, our Vet Connect service provider meeting at uh, – the CUNY Veterans Summit uh, in November, so we've got a great working relationship with Lisa, and we are even on a texting basis with each other. So we are in frequent communication, and she knows that we are uh, an ample support system for their efforts. Okay, so we'll be hearing uh, testimony soon from, uh, from others. Um, so before I continue, I just want to... Okay, so I'm going to ask uh, my co-chair. Uh, thank you, Chair Deutsch, appreciate that. I just have a few questions. What would it take for you to directly do a mailing to all of the veterans so that you know for sure that they receive the information rather than rely on, uh, put an, an intermediary step in and have the colleges do that. What that, would it take for you to directly? That would be one that? potential course of action. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I mentioned earlier, we think it's important for our, our student, veteran, and GI Bill user population to know that their specific institution is providing them with the information that is necessary to protect but their I'm interest. just saying as a secondary step, as a backup. That's, that's one, that's one of course, the, course of action, mm -hmm. but we haven't found that to be uh, necessary. If, if, it, if at any point it be, becomes, you know, something that we think could uh, be additive, we'll, we'll certainly consider that. I will say that in the, in the urgency of getting things out over these last several weeks, we, we have chosen the most efficient and effective means of doing so through not only the student veteran coordinators, but through national and local news coverage as well as social media and we'll certainly continue to consider every possible means of getting information okay. out. So the GI Bill uh, pays for 36 months, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And most students would go to a semester, which would be five months, and if they do two years, I mean a full year, that would be 10 months? It depends. Some students right. go year round, but it does, you, you point to, I think, or you allude to, one of the challenges, and that is uh, since the basic allowance for housing is paid only during the time that a right. GI Bill user is in school, one has to be careful to prorate one's uh, 
housing costs, for example, so that you're not using up the full amount of the monthly BAH on your rent because when you're, if you do choose to take, let's say, a, a break or a summer uh, 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 break in education, uh, then you will not be getting right. your BAH. So it does, it does point to the need for student veterans to work closely with their institutions that have experts who work with them on exactly those kinds of issues. Then also in terms of only providing 36 months of uh, GI coverage for tuition, what, how do you, how do you utilize CLEP so that mm -hmm. students will know that there might be other credits that they can attain yeah. that would help them, that they can apply that would help them no, attain I'm their I'm so degree. glad you asked that, Chair Barron, because you know, when we first started the um, Veterans on Campus initiative, we did some focus group testing, starting with our own office, uh, student veterans and their family members who had used the GI Bill, and we asked them, what do you know about the CLEP program? <laughs> the after the first 10 folks we, we polled said they'd never heard of the CLEP program, we knew that we had a challenge on our hands, which is why we have reached out to the College Board. And it's not only the CLEP program that we are highlighting to, to ensure not just that our veterans, but uh, that our service members and their families, before they ever leave their, 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 um, uh, their post camps and stations, that they know about the CLEP program. One of the things that the College Board is doing now is they work very closely um, to now connect students who are taking the CLEP examinations, they connect them to nonprofit organizations, for example, like the Posse Foundation, who then really help, you know, the College Board shines the light on their situation and then the nonprofits help them to find the best fit at the best institution for their needs and their strengths. So we're very excited about that partnership with the College Board. Another program that I think bears mentioning is the College Board's partnership with the Khan Academy because these are free materials mm -hmm. that the College Board's research has shown that on average 20 hours of devoted study and preparation with those free materials mm -hmm. yields a 100 point increase in SAT scores. So think of this. The College Board did a, they did a sort of an assessment when we, you know, sort of served up this challenge with the New York City school system. They looked at CUNY and they were drawn to John Jay's existing policies and came back to us and said, did you know that at John Jay today, a, 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 a young man or woman who has raised their right hand, joined the military, worked hard to apply their military uh, training mm -hmm. or college credit, has worked hard in uniform to get accredited college credits, can leave, John, can leave the service two semesters shy of a four-year degree under today's policies. So that really got our juices going to think about, boy, if we can transform the whole notion of what it is to serve to help our 18 to 24 yeah. year olds understand that this can be a path to the middle class. For our immigrant families, this can be a path to citizenship. And if you work hard from the day you start military service, this will be a, an investment in your lifetime of service. And then finally, before I turn it back to um, the co-chair here, the GI Bill then pays tuition at whatever institution they approve regardless of what that tuition cost okay so this is where um, it gets a little complicated but the GI Bill pays a certain level of tuition and it varies by school but then some schools can uh, have made the choice to opt into the yellow ribbon program which then the federal VA partners to in many cases make up the entire difference, but this varies from institution to institution. So there's a cap on how much tuition you will pay? The, I'll need to get back to you on the details of that. I know that it varies by institution. Some of our institutions here can probably give you more detailed reporting on that, but I do know that for some schools, uh, the yellow benefit program takes care of the entire tuition bill and many student veterans and their family members benefit greatly from that additional push so that they don't get out of college in, in considerable debt. It would be less debt than, than if they didn't have the GI Bill, but still considerable debt. 
So it's possible then that a veteran might want to go to um, one of your more elite institutions mm -hmm. and there's a cap that the GI Bill would provide for tuition. And if he doesn't get the benefit of the Yellow Ribbon Program, that that veteran person or he or she might not be able to go. That, 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 is, that is correct. Let me just uh, describe a little more uh, detail here, Madam Chair. Under the Yellow Ribbon Program, the post 9-11 GI Bill pays all resident tuition and fees for a public school, the lower of the actual tuition and fees or the national maximum per academic year for a private school. So that's where it gets a little complex. Wait, say that varies. again, the lower, say that one. We'll provide this to you as well, Madam okay. Chair. But the lower of the actual tuition and fees or the national maximum per academic year for a private school. If your actual tuition and fees exceed these costs, if you're attending a private school or attending a public school as a non-resident student, mm -hmm. for example, then degree-granting institutions participating in the Yellow Ribbon Program agree to make additional funds available for the educational programs without adding an additional charge to the GI Bill entitlement. So institutions voluntarily enter into these yellow ribbon agreements with the VA and choose the amount of tuitions and fees that will be contributed. The VA matches that amount and issues payments directly to the institution. Do all of New York City's institutions participate in this yellow ribbon benefit program? No, not, not, not all do. Okay, I would love to get that information in writing so that I could we research it a little further. We, we will absolutely provide that to you, Thank Madam you. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman. Thank you. I just want to, to recognize we have we're joined by Councilmember Paul Vallone mm -hmm. and Rodriguez was here. Oh, Rodriguez left. Okay. He was here. Um, all right, Commissioner. How many of the of the um, city's two hundred ten thousand um, uh, veterans are qualified for the GI uh, pre nine eleven and post nine eleven uh, GI Bill? We what's, know what's that approximately twelve thousand are using the GI Bill. I don't have data that would point to a specific number who are eligible but not using it. We do know that about 10% of our uh, veteran population here in New York City uh, is post 9-11, so they're at the prime age range to use their GI Bill. Uh, but for whatever reason, you know, not everyone uses it or uses it right away. And that's been one of the real benefits of the forever GI Bill that was passed this last year is there's no longer that 15-year time limit. So it really gives veterans and their families the flexibility to figure out what's really best for their needs. And, of course, it's transferable to family members as well. So it's, 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 it's a wonderful benefit. And as we know, this is a benefit that was started uh, on behalf of our World <coughs> War II returning veterans, 1944. But one thing I must, I cannot uh, fail to mention is that we know that it was not open to all of our returning World War II veterans. Our African American World War II veterans came back to this country, were not able to use their GI Bill, were not able to use their VA home loan, and hence were not able to gather wealth over a period of generations and transfer to that to their children and their, their, their uh, subsequent uh, generations as m many other veterans were able to do and have done. So I think that it's important to recognize that we have come a long way as a country, but we still have a long way to go. And that particularly gets to some of the predatory uh, practices, uh, Madam Chair, that you had mentioned earlier and things that we have to be vigilant about ensure that student veterans and their family members, GI Bill users, and all students, not just veterans, all students, have the safeguards that one will assist them with loan repayment if they've gotten into a bad situation with a bad actor school that's either gone out of business or has given them a worthless degree and they're saddled with debt and no path to a career, or those who were promised gainful employment by going to a career, trade, or vocational school, and the school, the institution has delivered no such outcome. We have to be vigilant and on guard and, and protective of those who are, after all, our cities and our nation's future. Thank you. So um, you have 12,000 um, student environments who are using the, uh, the GI Bill. So from the 12,000, how many are 
being used directly by the veteran and how many are being transferred over to a family member? We don't have that breakdown. We don't have right that now. breakdown, but we can we can uh, query our student veteran coordinators and we get a can get a breakdown on that for you. I I think it's important to um, to figure out how many are being used by a family member. Mm -hmm. Now from from the two hundred and ten thousand, you said that there's twelve hundred twelve thousand um, who are using the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. um, how do we reach out to the veterans who are uh, maybe eligible who are not using it, mm -hmm. or do we have a? Could we figure out a number of how many um, more may be qualified to um, to use the GI Bill, mm -hmm. if not directly, or having a family member use? Well, and uh, this is where use the um, GI Bill. I think uh, we we've, we've testified briefly here in this committee about our. Uh, veteran Success Network, but let me unpack it a little further uh, with you because it's got three pillars. Uh, first pillar is our Veterans on Campus initiative, shining a bright light on best practices, bringing in national best practices and really bringing that to bear for our uh, student veterans and their family members. The second pillar is our Mentor of Vet. So particularly now with the launch of Vet Connect NYC, we're not only in a position to connect our New Yorkers, whether they're new veterans, whether they're looking to make a career change at whatever stage of life they're in, but also for service members and their families who are serving at post camps and installations around the world who have already made that decision. We're not recruiting. If you've still got time to uh, deliver to our national security, we want you to do that. But if you've made the decision that now is that time, we want to invite those uh, native New Yorkers and other critters like me who come from all parts of this country to find their next mission in New York. Link them up with a mentor and that's really uh, a powerful way of getting this kind of information to our new vets coming on board as well as the myriad other ways that we work with social media, we work with our newsletter, we work with our partner organizations and we'll, we'll continue to tool up on our ways that we can continue to communicate and better connect services, care, benefits with our veterans and their family members. So um, I appreciate all the outreach that you're doing, uh, the VVS uh, does on this. But um, I want to see, I want to find a way to see if we could do like a major, major campaign in New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, tuition, we know, is not, is not cheap. And we don't know how many people may be paying off the student debt when they're, they might be just eligible mm -hmm. for 100 percent um, uh, free college. So I want to see how we can work together with the advocates that are here to do like a really a major, major campaign because people Let's are Let's make having 2019 a breakout year in that yeah. regard, Mr. Chair. And I will just say one note of caution, getting back, Madam Chair, to your earlier no, I just, just want to mention, Commissioner, that I was speaking at a uh, uh, high school graduation. Sure. And um, I mentioned about the GI Bill and a veteran approached me soon after saying, oh, you know, he has a child who's going to go to college. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I know that in one graduation, the one veteran approached me saying he had no, he had no idea. Yeah. But I think that from 210,000, uh, you have 12,000 who are using it. So there, has to, there must be a higher number than that. Oh, yes. There has to be a higher number. So if we know that even if it's 12,001, even for that one person. It's worth the effort. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, no. I'm just, I'm trying to just, we happen to be online, but I want to figure out a way that we could work together and we have all the advocates here to do like a major campaign. You know, we're, we're constantly, um, you know, the city tries to do as much as possible for those that just can make ends meet. And here we have the resources, the resources, I don't have to tell you, the resources are there. And all we need to do is really reach out to the 8.6 million New Yorkers, right? And 210,000 of those are veterans, right? You have five boroughs, you have 51 council members, you have assembly members, state senators. Let's do a major, um, uh, you know, campaign to reach out to the entire city. If you know a veteran, um, you know, if you know a veteran, let us know. Um, and let's make sure that every single veteran in this city um, knows that they are eligible for the GI Bill 
for free education. And let's really kick off 2019 and, and making sure. So I'm looking forward, Commissioner, to work with you and working um, with all the uh, great advocates. Absolutely. From your lips to God's ears, Mr. Chair, uh, this is work worth doing. And uh, we, we look forward to partnering with you and our, our great community here in New York City to do that work. One uh, just uh, cautionary note, getting back to Chair Barron, your question earlier about directly contacting the student veterans, the 12,000, I'm reminded that there are privacy concerns that we don't have access to their direct uh, personal information. Again, that, that is why we rely on the schools and the ed institutions to be able to contact them. But I think what you're saying, Mr. Chair, and I think what we can all agree on is that there are things we can do to build on what we've already done to get that word out everywhere. Make New York City the beacon of light, of hope, of inspiration for all of our veterans and their loved ones. That's something we need to be proud of in the new year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to ask my colleagues to have a few questions. We'll start with uh, uh, Council Member Holden. Thanks, Commissioner, for your testimony and, and, and for all your great work. Um, I think, you know, to echo um, uh, Chair Deutsch's um, um, concern, I, I, there we have 12,000 student veterans uh, who, who are um, utilizing the post-9-11 uh, GI Bill. I, I, we'd like to know how many are out there. It's a very important figure. How many are we reaching? Is 12,000 good? Is that bad? You know, I would think a lot more are eligible in their families that we really need to, to, to reach. And, and social media is, is great because it doesn't cost anything, really. Um, for our, if you can give us something, we can put on our council page, pages. Absolutely. And, uh, and really do, a you know, all council members, I think, should participate. I, I'd like to right. see that. And um, I just have a few questions on, on um, you mentioned the, the club program. Um, is there a cap on the credit allowances for that program? Is a cap. I'll need to get those details. We'll, we'll be glad to provide those to you. Okay. It varies by institution as it, well. It and and does that, is it vary by uh, in CUNY? Yes, it does. And should it? We're not in a position to comment on. I know, but I mean, I'd like to. Policy. Uh, I, I, I. That's not my field of expertise, but it does vary, and I'm sure when you speak. To when we yeah, when we hear the other testimony, maybe we can get that information. Um, do you know what colleges have the greatest veteran population in, in New York City? We do. We'd be glad to provide you. We've got a list of the or top Or just like a few 25. top ones, yeah. Sure. Uh, we've got NYU. We've got the number of the CUNY, you know, 3,400. Uh, so a quarter of the uh, GI Bill user population is from CUNY. Uh, Columbia, I would say, uh, has just made great strides. Again, Dean Owen, I just want to recognize you and your team. But Columbia now enrolls more student veterans and GI Bill users than all of the other Ivy League schools combined, which is amazing. And what Columbia is doing with their uh, massive online uh, 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 education program is that they are, are reaching out to community colleges across the country. Several months ago, I was at an event and I ran into two uh, student veterans who are now uh, roommates. And I asked them, you know, what are you doing? Well, they had just enrolled in Columbia. One was from Texas, one was from Louisiana, and they had met and they were roommates there. But, and it was because of the massive online program, which is free to any of our institutions. That's one of the reasons we've started out the Veterans on Campus program by going to visit and shining a light on the existing best practices and then bringing in the national best practices from the Student Veterans of America and College Board. So we'll, with this, this is an ongoing uh, program that will continue to uh, build on the many schools here in New York City where veterans and their family members are thriving. We've got, a, if you want to just, uh, uh, any of the other, I mean, you know, we've, we've gone to 12 schools in the CUNY system, we've gone to Manhattan College, we've gone to Pace, we've gone to NYU, to Columbia, to Fordham, I mean, they're, you know, we've got a, a such a treasure trove of higher educational institutions. In fact, just, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, Medgar Evers, uh, <coughs> it was just, what, a month ago, uh, right after Veterans Day, Medgar Evers, as an example, uh, had a wonderful program uh, honoring the history and the legacy of Medgar Evers himself, as well as honoring <coughs> their student veterans and highlighting their service to the the community and the students at large. S 
it's, it's, it's heartening. I could tell you story after story of schools here, for example, Manhattan College. They ta to told us about not only this holistic wellness program that they provide their student veterans, but they also told us about how the evolution of their student veterans' participation and their role in campus life. That it started out where, you know, they were just glad to find each other. They had a student veteran lounge. They kind of let their hair down. They tell war stories, you know, as we veterans tend to do. You know, there I was. And, you know, at some point, eh, you know, okay, but what can we do? Because service is embedded in our DNA. Once we've taken that vow, we want to continue serving others. So the students at Manhattan College, they decided to work with their faculty and fellow students to organize panels that could then illustrate various aspects of life in service, deployment to war, and it's just stirred up a whole nother level of intellectual and emotional and spiritual richness on that campus. There are best practices across this college, and I could, you know, I mentioned John Jay already in terms of what they've done, and BMCC has been just such a great partner. And they're uh, sharing that with the, the other schools. Absolutely. Great. Okay. That's we, we, had a, we had a civic uh, uh, panel with BMCC just this last year where we brought in city leaders uh, from across city government where we talked to student veterans and their family members about the various civil service opportunities that are ready. So we're, we're, we're excited about what we have learned over these first few months of the Veterans on Campus uh, campaign and we also, what I didn't mention, in addition to the second pillar, which is the mentor of vet, anyone who wants to serve as a mentor, we're happy. Pass again is the lead for that, 25 organizations that would help uh, match the best fit for veterans and their family members. The third pillar, it's called our Veteran Career Council. It's currently under construction. It will be launched early in this new year. We're very excited. It's a public-private partnership where we bring in six or seven different industries, starting with city government, which is we already hire the most number of veterans in the city at over 9,000 veterans, service members, reservists, and National Guards members. But we want to be able to work with industry leads from industries like real estate, finance and banking, uh, technology, this being New York, fashion, media and entertainment, health and health care, uh, so that those industry leads can influence their <coughs> colleagues in those industries to open up externships and internships <coughs> so student veterans can get career-relevant work experience wh while they're tuning up their, their, their educational uh, uh, credentials and, and qualifications. So we're very excited about uh, the, the landscape and the, um, not only the landscape as it currently exists in New York City, we know that this is just such a rich uh, area for, for student veterans and their loved ones to gain world-class education and training, but we're also excited about where we can take that. And communication is a huge piece of that, so we welcome the opportunity yeah. to work both with your uh, Committee on Higher Education as well as the Committee on Veterans and anyone else who wants to be part of this campaign. We're all yeah. in. Great, thanks. Uh, just uh, one other question, I guess. Um, uh, while teaching at CUNY, I had many students, that many student veterans, they started their college life and then um, were either drafted or went into the service. And... Um, so there might, might have been a 10 or 15 years lapse in their education. Many of their, credi their uh, prior credits expired. Is there any program in, in currently uh, in the colleges that honor those credits because they were called into service or they did serve and they, the credits c shouldn't expire? Well, one expire? of the best practices that we've observed at the colleges and universities that we've met with are those uh, institutions that take a personalized approach, that sit down with an individual prospective student and look at their record and figure out how can they make the most of whatever prior college they've gotten, their military credits that they've gotten in uniform. But I will say this, as we were reminded yesterday, I testified yesterday in Albany uh, on veteran employment, and there was a, a witness there who testified, who works with veteran, student veterans and their family members on a regular basis. And, you know, he made the point, he said, you know, we have to get the word out to our student veterans and their family members who can make use of this national 
treasure the GI Bill. If they start out at a poor performing school, that then limits, that, that defines the trajectory of what they can then connect to from that point forward. So if we can get them to a good start, then it just opens up the, the pathways to, to education going forward and that, that's, that's what this is all about. Understanding that not every veteran or family member wants to be, you know, a Thai guy, as we used to say in the Army, or doesn't want to be in banking or finance, doesn't want to carry a briefcase and go to work every morning. That's where the Forever GI Bill is fantastic, the way it's opened the doors to intensive coding training programs, for example, where, you know, good paying jobs, $75,000, $80,000 a year after a few months of intense training. Or, you know, here at DCAS, we know that our trades positions, you know, our workforce is aging out. There are opportunities for student veterans and their loved ones to get that training. Helmets to hard hats, they also testified yesterday in Albany. What a fantastic program to take folks, whatever their strengths are, we need, we need our student veterans, their family members, they are our advanced, leading, natural, renewable resource. And what's to be renewed? Their commitment to and capacity for ongoing service. Great, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I was gonna ask you, Commissioner, could we get something from DVS over the next few weeks? So this will be could start off our massive campaign in January. So this will be could give them out to, to members, um, elected officials, and just start blasting it out and letting people know. That sounds great, Chair Deitch. Right. Uh, also, you mentioned Columbia has, uh, um, has a, uh, the highest number of uh, veterans, student veterans. Do we I have, have the highest. I mentioned that they have more student veterans, and it would be good for you to, to query them directly, okay. but more student veterans and GI Bill users, which include yeah, family members, okay. than all other Ivy League institutions combined. Do we have the numbers? Do, do you have the numbers on, on the 25 uh, campuses? Uh, it, yes. Uh, we, we don't have that with us right now, but we, we have, have those. We'll, we'll okay. give you that roll-up. Absolutely. We have, yeah. Okay. So and I, I would say about Columbia, and this is true for all – all of our schools, uh, you know, attracting student veterans and their loved ones to enroll in your program, it doesn't happen by accident. There are keys to success. There are best practices. And our goal, we're not educators, we're not academics, but we're, you know, at DBS, our mission is veterans and, our, and their families. That's our only mission. And so we're so excited to be able to spread best practices. Yesterday, Mike Haney, Dr. Haney, who's the uh, vice chancellor as well as the director, the founding director of the Institute for Veterans and Military Families at Syracuse. <laughs> Talk about what a difference in leadership makes. Five years ago, their incoming uh, chancellor made student veterans and their family members one of the top four pillars of his strategic aims. They had about 200 GI Bill users five years ago. Today, they've got over 1,300, and they were just named the top academic institution, this vet veteran, the top veteran, uh, student veteran friendly institution in the country. So we've got around us. We are surrounded by institutions who are dedicated to do the right thing who want to implement best practices, and our job is to shine a big light and let them know what's going on out there so we can accelerate that process. So do we know, um, for example, what Columbia is doing different than the other campuses, that, the, that they have more people, more veterans who are using the GI Bill well, I think as one far of as their, camp, you know, their campaign? On yeah, so one of the things that they've done is they've, they've added to their massive online uh, course material one of their courses is a, a co course that's entitled Learning About Learning, or words to that effect. It's, it's something close study. to that. Okay. Uh, it's within the, the School of General Studies. And again, Dean Owen is, is our expert, our resident expert and pioneer of this approach. Mm -hmm. But this is part of their uh, offering that goes out free to community colleges. It's, it's freely accessible and it goes out to community colleges and it introduces the notion to student veterans or service members who haven't yet made that decision, but it introduces the notion that, you know, 
they can set their sights and come to New York City. And whether it's going to Columbia or whether it's going to one of our community campuses, what, I mean, you know, there's no one institution that's right for everyone. But certainly, we can learn from those right here in our midst who have already uh, found ways of better connecting and attracting and matching to make sure that our student veterans and their loved ones get the best fit for what their needs, strengths, goals, and aspirations may be. Wow. So was this information like relates to the other 24 campuses of telling them, you know something, Columbia is setting a good example here? Yeah, so, so in January, and as we've gone around and talked to the various uh, campuses and school presidents and provosts and uh, leaders, what we promised them is that we will be publishing a Keys to Success that'll come out in January. And so Columbia certainly has a best practice, but we've got numerous community, uh, every institution that we've been to has at least one best practice that we want to be able to shine a light on for all of the other campuses to learn from. So I'm, I'm going to be working with my colleague, um, uh, Chair Barron, and uh, I know Great. she has um, a staff member who is a veteran. And Terrific. Yeah, she's, um, and we're going to see if we could possibly uh, reach out to CUNY to see if we could set up a meeting between all 25 campuses um, and DVS and the, the commissioner and the advocates to see how we could um, all figure out to, how to do a better job and what resources CUNY may need uh, in order to do more outreach. And uh, I think that, um, you know, Columbia is setting a good example. And let's have a CUNY competition, right? Um, well, then, Chair Deitch, you're going to have to add in Fordham and Pace and NYU. There are a whole bunch of folks in that so competition. So in, but, yeah, uh, so New, in, New York City, in New York City, you have, tw you have 25, right? There you so, go. So it's not it's not uh, it's not a long distance for someone to travel to be in New York City. If you can ask someone from a different state to come in, it's going to be a little more difficult. So let's start from New York City, and then uh, we'll see. We'll take it from it's there. Like Arthur Ashe said, yeah. start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Let's do it. Okay, uh, I'd like to um, ask um, Councilmember Vallone. He has some questions. Thank Council you to both of our Vallone. chairs. Good morning, Good Commissioner. Morning. Or is your enthusiasm needed after yesterday's Amazon hearings? I'm telling you. Still recovering from that <laughs> yesterday. Um, it's always a pleasure to see you. Merry You're Christmas right, and happy holidays to you and the staff. If Thank we don't you, see you so again. much. Um, this is a, a very important topic, and I think Chair Barron and I were just leaning over and talking about the numbers, and I understand the pillars and the enthusiasm and, and all that. I'm looking for some maybe a specific goal or program that you can target that can help the numbers when you see the drastic drop from undergraduate to graduate. And this is just looking at the 2018 numbers, but mm -hmm. it's, it's quite, quite startling to see the, how few veterans are actually pursuing in the CUNY world um, to graduate studies. So being one of those Thai guys, although not today, uh, <laughs> it's not such a bad career to go after. I think our three generations, we've done pretty good at it. So, um, I'd like to see maybe what you're thinking on how we can get those numbers up. So the way we conceptualize this, Council Member Vallone, is we conceptualize a virtuous cycle of service. And so our Veterans on Campus initiative has started with where we are to shine a light on existing best practices. Now with the launch of Vet Connect NYC, we're working with the Pentagon and with the branches of service so that we can connect with service members and their families wherever they're located around the world. But so do you see that connection leading to, or okay, is there, so, is there so, a, so, so a hear barrier out, somewhere hear, there? Hear, hear me out, Council Member Vallone. We're just You're going on a long circle. We're, yeah, we're a third of <laughs> way on that circle. So that's, the, that's connecting with them in the 12 to 15 months before they've actually gotten out of uniform, which okay. is the ideal time to connect. And then moving around that circle to be able to portray, and this gets to what Chair Deitch, Chair uh, Barron, we've been talking about in terms of a communication strategy to be able to upend the prevailing narrative of veterans that either portrays them as heroes that are untouchable or somehow uh, defective or worst of all, uh, invisible. We're human beings and the struggles are real but the, the strengths are also real. And we want to lead with those strengths and feature the faces and the voices and the stories of veterans and their family members, the vibrance, the resilience, the flourishing lives that they're leading. And then that has an impact on the parents, teachers, K-12 
counselors and coaches who are guiding and directing today's 18 to 24 year olds. Now, this is how this connects this this circle of of service, this virtuous cycle of service. The circle of, of life. I've had to start singing come, the Lion comes King. Back to your question, <laughs> is that we know that if we can communicate to those 18 to 24 year olds who are entering service about the fact that if they view this as an investment in their life service and start working hard to apply their military credits, their uh, college accredits, accredited courses they, they do while they're in uniform, that today at John Jay with existing policies, they can get out and be two semesters short of a four-year degree. Now, if we also get to those young men and women and let them know about the college board programs, so the CLEP courses that can help them rack and stack credits without mm -hmm. having to use their GI Bill, and also be able to jack up their SAT scores by using the free Khan Academy scores, you can see then they can draw scholarships. Well, that's what money. Councilman Holden is And then they're in a position to. to use more of their GI Bill for graduate programs. That's absolutely for th that, that, So do you that, think that, the, the biggest the impediment grail. is is the course attainment and the level of getting? Sometimes it's the, the barriers there could be either the entrance exam, the credits attained, the ability to get past that hurdle just like with specialized schools versus non-specialized schools and sure. students trying to gain. Just want to make sure we're providing that, that the tool base so that it's an option for our GIs to take that level Absolutely. and not just leave it to them to have to figure out. Precisely. That's, that's the biggest And problem. that's where not only the trained peer-to-peer -peer social support is so vital, mm -hmm. but also the mentorship mm -hmm. support so that they can, they can learn from their fellow veterans who perhaps have not made the best choices and got kind of caught up in that scrum of figuring out on their own. Or maybe we can extend the partnerships like with Columbia and Fordham and Syracuse and the schools that you mentioned Absolutely. from the graduate to undergraduate to the graduate. We've got program. so many success stories at the, at the schools that are right here within our reach. And we can tell their stories and we can, we can, we can help guide incoming veterans, service members, and family members to understand that the resources are there to help them make the best decisions for their futures. Fordham worked for us, so I'm sure it can work. There Thank you, you Chairs. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, uh, Commissioner, we spoke about uh, veterans who, um, who might not um, have knowledge that they're eligible for education, mm -hmm. free education if they're part of the GI Bill, but we didn't speak about how many of the 2010 veterans may not know that they are eligible for the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. So um, is it possible um, from the 210,000 veterans that some of those veterans may not, e may not even know that they're eligible for the GI Bill? It, it's certainly possible. You know, I would, I, I would say that for that proportion of our veteran population that tends younger or is more media savvy and is connected to social media and to the internet and to those kinds of communication piece, it would be more unlikely. But I would never say that that news has, has, has reached and penetrated the consciousness of every veteran in our midst. And I think that it, you know, for example, uh, one of the issues they talked about yesterday again in Albany was the challenge of the TAP, the, transi the Transitional Assistance Program. And the Department of Defense continues to work to improve that. In fact, they had somebody there from the Department of Defense who talked about the, this later, latest rendition. But so many times when service members and their families are getting ready to transition out, they've got so many things going on. Maybe they have a medical condition, they're being medically boarded, or maybe they've got you know, worries about their families. Whatever it is, you know, moving, transitioning is such a stressful period of time. So we can't take for granted that everyone knows about the programs that are available. And I, I look forward to working with you and members of this committee and the Committee on Higher Education and anyone else who wants to join this campaign, and of course, the best news of all is that we're not alone. We've got advocates and, and giants in our midst who are here today and others throughout our great city. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have two, two more questions, and I'm going to go to my uh, co-chair. Um, so people are, I'm sure, have, are viewing this at home. Maybe not. Maybe they're watching something else. Maybe a soap <laughs> opera. <Really>? But... <laughs> 
So we're here live. So I have two more questions um, for those um, who are watching. And for anyone that knows a veteran yes. who is out there, it could be a, a friend, a neighbor, um, someone you just met, mm -hmm. like I met uh, this morning at Starbucks. I think I met three people who are in this room. Mm -hmm. So you, you're always walking around meeting veterans and seeing people. So uh, my first question to you, Commissioner, and, and I hope that this information gets passed along, is um, who, uh, which family members are eligible uh, for the through the GI Bill to get this uh, free education? Which which family members? Well, yeah, is it a, uh, um, a child, a spouse, as well as like children? Children, I, a cousin? I don't so think that cousin is. I, so I think it has to be so a, actually so a registered de dependent of the. So uh, it's a dependent of that uh, of, of the veteran. But uh, think of, of that. What number. that means for our veterans to be able to pass this benefit and share it with their children, because not every veteran. Uh, coming out of the service, uh, you know, needs to necessarily is, is it, go is back Is it also to a sibling? No, it's a person No, so okay, it's a child, so right? Yeah. We all agree? Children only? Okay. So, so spouses. Spouses, spouses and, and children. Okay. So my second question is if, the, um, if a veteran or a family of a veteran or a friend of a veteran mm -hmm. uh, needs to find out if a certain veteran is uh, eligible to be uh, to be part of this GI Bill, what do they need to do? Who do they call? Yeah, so so to determine what benefits eligibility, you know, we contact our colleagues at the federal VA and they work with us. If a, if a prospective student veteran is interested in a particular institution, uh, we may reach out to that institution and link them up with the student veteran coordinator who then helps them sit down with their particular uh, experts there. So there are a number of ways of determining that. Uh, or what's, themselves. what's the easiest way? If someone yeah. wants to uh, find online, out. Online, you can go, yeah. the, D, the federal VA has, has an online platform where you can uh, do your, your own self-assessment and research. For some people, that, that just doesn't work. Uh, that's one of the things that we knew. So can we they call? Can they call DVS? There's a hotline. They can call hotline. DVS. So There's also a federal hotline. Can we get the number? Hotline. Yeah. Can we get the, I want to know the easiest way for someone to find but out. Chair I can't tell you the easiest way because there is no uh, cookie cutter answer for our veterans. Some really like to do their own independent research online. Others want to call the, the federal, you know, GI Bill hotline. Others feel comfortable going to one of our satellite uh, veteran resource centers. So that's why we really work to provide something for everyone in the preferred mode and means of communication that fits their strengths. So again, um, I don't know who to call, right? And uh, Start with us. Yeah, okay, so how do I reach out to you? Okay, so you can reach out to us either by social media, uh, hashtag NYC Veterans. You can call our number, 212-416-5250. You can contact us on uh, Vet Connect NYC, which is 833-VETS-NYC. I mean, there's any number of ways that you can reach out to us. You can, you can write a note to me online. Just ask the commissioner. Send me a note. We get correspondence through City Hall all the time from that mode. Again, 311. If none of that makes sense, 311. They'll get the message to us. We want to just simplify it, but we know that we can't. Simple is not the same as single. Simple is providing a variety of ways for folks to choose from, and for many folks, 311 becomes that. Or, for example, our work with the First Lady in the Thrive NYC program. You know, veterans can, can contact 1-888-NYC-WELL. Uh, there are all manner of ways for us to get in, in touch with each other. We have over 80 vetted service providers currently who are members of our Vet Connect NYC network. So, for example, you know, folks, may be working with the IABA RIP program and have a question. IABA may reach out to us, we may reach out to them, or we may you know, choose to reach out to Coca Copain because we've got a legal question to one of our expert legal service providers. I mean, that's the joy of having the team that we've built, knowing that we can't do everything, but our particular strength is being able to develop the relationships where we can rapidly connect those whom we serve with those who can best serve them. Yeah, okay, I got it. So, I mean, I like to, you know, be make it very easy for people just to get information. Like, 
I could challenge everyone here that if you call my office now, any day from 9 to 5, the phone at my office will get picked up before two rings. As long as you, you all don't call at the same time, I guarantee you it's going to be picked up before two rings because I make it very easy. I don't need people calling my office and it should ring three, four, five times and then maybe go to a voicemail. The phone always gets picked up. I never had it in four and a half years that the phone rang more than twice when I called my office. You could try it. Um, just give it Addison, from now to five o'clock. Don't waste your time. I've tried it. It's there. <laughs> so it's, my it's so two my rings <laughs> and your responsiveness is well, Chair Dyke. So, so my, my point is is that I just want to like people that um, are watching now or just getting the information out. So I would ask them call three one one. If you know a veteran, right? Make sure you pick up the phone. Call three one one. You'll get to DVS. We have yep. many non for profits who are, are ready and available to help. Um, so just make sure that you you make the call. So if you know a vet, um, you know make the make the call. Let's find out if someone uh, may be eligible for the GI Bill that may not know that he or she is not not eligible for it. Let's get everyone signed on. Let's put this. Let's put our our country. Um, let's make sure that any and all resources gets put into our veterans, whichever way possible. Um, Chair Deitch, thank you for your leadership, absolutely. For any veteran or family member out there who's just heard your words, let me just double down on that. There is no daylight. The people in this room demonstrate the support that is out there across our great city. You are not alone. We're here to have your back and to get you on track and to learn from you, and we're all in this together. It's all about relationships. Yes, I agree. Um, okay, so I'm going to call upon the former chair of, uh, actually, um, I think you were you were, used to be chair of the veterans, right? Chair Eugene. Yes, yeah, Chair Eugene. Good morning, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning, Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And Commissioner, thank you very much uh, for your service and you know, uh, you are doing with dedication and passion. So you motivate me also to put more, you know, uh, uh, motivation in what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, oh. And to all the veterans, thank you also for your service. Thank you. And uh, we know that um, veterans, when they go to serve, they spend a lot of time. It all depends. It's, uh, you know, uh, many years. And uh, when somebody, when they have to get back to civilian life, to regular, some of the time may be difficult, the transition. Yes. Yes. They get back on regular life. It's not easy. It's not easy for many reasons that you know. And we know also that, that during their service, they acquire a lot of skill, knowledge, experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they get, get back after service, is there any, any uh, uh, opportunity or support or service to help them get credit for the skill or the knowledge, the experience that they have acquired. Because some of them in different fields, they learn so much. And probably, uh, uh, I don't know if uh, that exists, some assistance or service or program to help them transition and get credit for what they know already in order for them to pursue their education. Absolutely, in fact, every institution here in this room and across the city work sits down with the prospective student veteran or family member and goes over their military training and service record both the military training that they may they may have had that can be then applied for college credit as well as the accredited college courses that if they were industrious if they were committed if they really were serious about their their investment in their life of service that they may have taken and passed during their time in uniform, those then are evaluated by the institution to see which credits that, that then can be uh, applied towards a either two-year or four-year or uh, in some cases a graduate degree. Thank you very much. One of the things that I observe personally, not, uh, uh, not only for the veterans, but in general, in the city of New York, even in the nation, we may have the best program, the best services available for people, but the connection, you know, yes. uh, that connecting people who are in need, who deserve the services, to the services, some of them is not easy task for many reasons, because I've seen that several times. We may make the effort, you know, put a lot of energy to have great program, 
But the outreach to those people, some of the time, is not the best. But in terms of variance, I believe that, I think that, that, you know, something, you know, you have that already, you probably have, you know, peer to peer. Yes. Variance reaching variance. So my question is, how many variance you have working in the system to reach out other veterans and to uh, uh, guide them and other for them to get not only the services available but on time and to, be re to, to get ready to take advantage to capitalize on the services that we have. Do we have veterans reaching veterans? Mm -hmm. you know, and do we have enough of veterans reaching out to veterans? You know, you've, you've touched really, uh, Council Member uh, Eugene, on just the most powerful bond I can point to. As Jonathan Shea uh, once put it, the veteran-to-veteran, peer-to-peer bond is as strong as the mother-infant bond. It's a survival bond because in harm's way, my survival depends on my buddy having my back. And that means that my buddy's got to know his or her job. And at that point, all distinctions in terms of religion, geography, race, ethnicity, you know, all of that fades away. It's just a matter of can you do what you're trained to do in a way that we will fulfill the mission and we will all get back, hopefully, with God's will, back alive. That doesn't always happen. We know that in war, good people die no matter what, no matter what our leaders do. But we also know, for example, here in the city, uh, that this has been one of the factors, for example, that has been uh, so instrumental in explaining our outsized impact with reducing veteran homelessness. One of the things we did early on uh, in establishing DVS and even the year leading up to that was to hire a team of veteran peer coordinators both veterans, family members, folks who have walked the walk, lived the life, and who can be there by the side with homeless veterans and their loved ones and get them into permanent housing. This thread, this peer-to-peer -peer bond, threads through <coughs> everything we do. It's one of the reasons why that second pillar of our Veteran Success <coughs> Network, the Mentor of Vet uh, program with those 25 organizations that do mentoring for veterans, service members, and their families, one of the reasons we stood that up, because it's such an important bond. And so uh, when it comes to uh, our student veterans and their loved ones, and I think you'll see this across the institutions here in the city, it's that, that, that uh, veteran, family member, peer bond that becomes the glue, the initial glue that really helps guide, helps steer, helps support, and then, of course, with that support, veterans can really flourish and totally and fully integrate within the larger community, the larger society. So absolutely, that's something that we'll systems. continue to, you know, throughout the, for example, uh, the CUNY system, the PROVE program that I had mentioned earlier, the Project for Return and Opportunity for Veterans Education, they really capitalize on this peer uh, student model, and it's something that I think we can, you ask, you know, is there enough? I think it's something we can always build on. And the sooner we can link up uh, uh, veterans to veterans, family members, uh, uh, peers to peers, uh, that really gives us the initial glue and the foundation from which good things can happen and communication efforts can really take root. I can talk to a student veteran who you know, may listen to part of what I say, but it's not going to be anything as effective as, let's say, if it's an infantryman uh, veteran who then has a fellow infantry uh, veteran, and better yet, if they're both Marines, and say, hey, buddy, you know, you're going down the wrong alley. I tried that. I thought I knew everything, but I didn't. And if you do this, don't do what I did. You do this. It's going to work out better. And the culture that we're then working to inculcate here in New York City is a culture where eventually, yes, as Chair Deitch and uh, Chair Barron, we've talked about the importance of competition. Sure, competition. This is a great competition for talent. But just as a good, a really great salesperson is not content to just make a sale, 
a really great culture here in New York City for our student veterans and GI Bill users is not just content to get a student GI Bill user in the classroom. It has to be the best fit for that student GI Bill user, family member or veteran. And so what I envision going forward is a time when, let's say, a, a prospective student veteran comes to, oh, I don't know, I'm not going to name a school. Let's say they go to one of our great schools in New York City and says, you know, I'm really interested in engineering, and I'm not just any kind of engineering, but I want to do bioengineering. And I envision a time when that institution could say, well, you know, that's a great career field, but, you know, we've got other great programs, but if you want to get really the best education in this career field, you might want to go talk to the folks at another institution here in our city. That's the kind of culture that seeks to match strength to strength, institutions working together to help institutions find the best fit for their strengths and needs. And I think we're already well on that effort. When I look out and I see the partnerships, for example, with our two-year community colleges, which are such an important step in the ladder to higher education, and I see the partnership that re really meshes with their transition as they learn more and, and develop and go on that ladder, and hopefully do if they're interested in adding graduate programs and degrees to their preparation, that's where we're headed, and I look forward to working with each of you on that journey as we uh, take that hill. <coughs> Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you right, before I go to my co-chair, I just want to um, ask you uh, two, two other things. So firstly, if, if we could get that information of how many inquiries come into VetConnect and by w and what categories. Sure. And also, I want to see if uh, 311, how many inquiries um, for veteran services come through 311 to see if we need, uh, first of all, we have to make sure that when you do call 301, that uh, the person answers, yes. understands, and doesn't ask like 150 questions before they connect you. But once you mention veteran, they they know, yes. okay, we're gonna transfer you the information over to DVS. Now how does that information get to you from 311? Do you have a screen at DVS that the information comes in? How does it, how does it get into you? Yeah, so that uh, information, if, if it's during business hours, 3-1 will actually connect the individual with our front desk at the DVS hub here on 1 Center Street. And that's 212-412, is that the number you gave me? 212-416. 416-5250, okay. yes. And that's always answered? And if business nine to five. our aim is to have that, that answered. I, I haven't reached your standard yet of two rings, Chair okay. Dutch, but uh, yes. So 3-1 will uh, call the 212-416-5250 number? Yes. Okay. Or, yes, and then an email is also sent to the DVS staff from 311 with information on the request so that we can log it in to our CRM okay. system and then track and make sure that we have followed up and... Uh, so, who in your, so, so someone in your staff gets that email? Yes. So you have one person assigned to the 311 inquiries? We have redundancy, so we make sure that the, that we have a new director of constituent services, Letitia Rousseau. Some of you know her. She's been with us for many years. Okay. Uh, but she directs our coordination team, and so we make sure that multiple eyes are on that message stream so that it okay. doesn't fall through the cracks. Okay. So if you could, if you could just, uh, let's, if you get back with the numbers of, of how many inquiries, three, sure. 311, and also if we could see if it goes by categories, like for what, what issues, um, um, were called in for. I mean, could be they just send it over to DVS and then maybe then when you uh, put in that information, then you probably separate that, right? Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll spell that um, out. So um, I just want to acknowledge we're joined here by majority leader and superstar, Lori Cumbo. Terrific. She may deny it, but she had a Sabbath meal at my house <laughs> Friday night this past Friday. She came with a little one prince. She asked me, what, what is gefilte fish? <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask my, uh, my coach here. To, she has a few questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, for the for-profit institutions are governed by a federal provision that's called the 90-10 rule, and that mandates that for-profit colleges cannot receive more than 90% of their revenue from federal student aid from the Department of Education. However, funds from the VA do not count in the 90% category. And that means that in theory, if a for-profit receives the full 90% from the Department of Education 
and the remaining 10% from the VA, it could operate entirely on federal money. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the 2004 Senate Committee report revealed that eight of the top 10 institutions receiving GI Bill dollars, 2.9 billion, were for-profit schools, including a few that operated in New York City. So my question is, uh, does the DVS track students who have enrolled in for-profit institutions? We work with a number of for-profit institutions here in New York City. We are not a regulatory agency, so we don't you know, investigate uh, schools. That's the role of DCA. The loophole that you identify, however, is one that's been identified by a number of our both uh, city as well as state and national uh, service providers and advocacy organizations because this is part of what has led to mm -hmm. um, the specter of disproportionately the bad actors in this space have come from for-profit institutions. Now, let me be very clear, and this is national data now, the majority of for-profit institutions are not bad actors, but of those who are bad actors, the vast majority of them are, and many of them take advantage of this loophole, which then leads them down a path all too often of doing things like under-investing in curriculum, under-investing in teaching, under-investing in career counseling and in the kind of guidance and support that students need to succeed. And so I think it's an area that we need, to, as a city, uh, we need to look at very carefully and determine w whether, as in the case of the BAH issue, which as a city are electeds uh, led by the mayor and others, including um, uh, Ca Congressman uh, Donovan um, and members of our city council sent a letter to the federal government and uh, demanded that that issue be re-looked. We didn't get the total response that we wanted. I think we got a four and a half, five percent increase. This is the Staten Island uh, discrepancy and, and disparity in BAH funding. But I think this is an issue where uh, we could have a very constructive voice and we could call out uh, uh, this particular practice which not only disadvantages, in fact, much of the time even cripples student veterans and their loved ones, but also veterans from across the country, whether or not they've served in uniform. It's just simply wrong to go into debt to have been made career promises for a career that doesn't exist, to have a worthless piece of paper to put on the wall and to be crippled with debt and hopeless about what your prospects are to redress or to seek, um, uh, uh, to, s to seek a solution that will make you whole. Thank you. I and couldn't agree more, thank, thank you. you. And just one final point, if you could give me further information, uh, you can send it to me because the time is moving sure, on. Sure, sure. About the source of funding for the Yellow Ribbon Fund, for the Yellow Ribbon Program. Is it through college grants? Is it through loans? So if you could give me further we'll information. We'll put together a summary on that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so Mr. much, Postman. Chair Barron. Thank you. Um, so I think um, we're going to go to our panel. I want uh, Commissioner, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank I want to you wish so you uh, a Merry Deitch. Christmas, Happy and Healthy New Year. And Cassandra, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Dyke. And the same to you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Happy Fair. holidays. All right, we're going to go to our panel. Uh, I'd like to first call up uh, Christopher Rosa, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, CUNY, Lisa Vieta, Liara uh, Shadavsky.
question. Uh, before, uh, before you begin, I'd like to ask counsel to sway you in. Would you please raise your right hands? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Please state your names for the record. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Christopher Rosa, Interim Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs of CUNY. Lisa Biapa, University Director of Veteran Affairs, CUNY. Leora Shadowski, Co-Director for Peru, Project for Return and Opportunity in Veterans Education. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. Um, Chair Barron, Chair Deutsch, Majority Leader Cumbo, thank you again for having us all here today. Um, I'd like to begin my testimony today uh, by sincerely thanking you for your ongoing support of the City University of New York and for your enduring commitment to our returning veterans. My name is Chris Rosa and I proudly serve as CUNY's Interim Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. I'm honored to serve on this afternoon's panel with two of CUNY's outstanding and most remarkable leaders in promoting the success and wellness of CUNY student veterans. Lisa Biapa, CUNY's dedicated Director of Veterans Affairs and Liara Sadovsky, the co-director of the Project for Return and Opportunity in Veterans Education, Project PRU, at CUNY Silverman School of Social Work. Together, we will describe the depth of CUNY's commitment to student veterans, as well as share some of the challenges we face in meeting the unique needs of student veterans to ensure their success. CUNY is deeply committed to making our university a first choice destination for veterans. As the nation's leading public urban university, and because of our legacy of providing higher education opportunity for generations of those returning from military service, we believe it is our duty to open our doors wide to today's student veterans. Moreover, as CUNY seeks to attract New York's top students, it is in our interest to be attractive uh, for veterans. Veterans typically offer a profile that is highly desirable by colleges and universities. They are mature, goal-oriented, mission-driven, experienced leaders who work tirelessly to achieve their objectives and look for ways to make meaningful contribution to their communities. They not only understand the concept of sacrifice for the greater good, they've lived it. In short, veterans are exactly the kind of students and role models we welcome on our campuses. CUNY proudly educates more than 3,300 student veterans, an increase of close to 300% over the last decade. In ways different from previous veteran cohorts, today's student veterans at CUNY reflect new realities of the military engagements in which they've served. Indeed, a third of veterans deployed in Operations Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom, and New Dawn were deployed multiple times. When it comes to college costs, CUNY remains by far New York City's most affordable option for veterans. Student veterans who are eligible for the post 9-11 GI Bill at 100% and those who are residents of New York State can attend CUNY at no cost. Furthermore, veterans who are not New York State residents are charged the same tuition rate as New York State residents for a period of 18 months from their first date of attendance. Finally, veterans are exempt from the CUNY admission application fee. Indeed, uh, CUNY issues more than 1,000 veteran undergraduate application fee waivers to veterans from all branches of the armed forces, including reservists and National Guard members, which equates to almost 80,000 in waivers per year, $80,000. CUNY understands the transition from military life to higher education and has put in place services to ease this transition. In 2013, CUNY issued the report of the Council of Presidents Ad Hoc Committee on Strengthening Services to Veterans from Soldier to Scholar to address the needs of student veterans, to examine our practices, and develop recommendations to improve the experience of student veterans at CUNY. This report provided several recommendations that have guided our university to better support student veterans from recruitment and admission through graduation and ultimately to transition to employment. Once enrolled, CUNY student veterans have access to services and programming designed to provide a supportive environment and a successful academic experience. 
Some veterans returning from military service can face emotional, financial, academic, and cultural obstacles to college transition. To meet the unique needs of returning veterans, most of our campuses have full-time veteran services coordinators, and these coordinators serve as one-stop resource for student veterans. Most of our campuses also have established dedicated co-curricular spaces for student veterans. To build our capacity to welcome veterans and support their success, many CUNY faculty and staff members receive military cultural competence training. Several of our colleges have cross-departmental working veteran services teams comprised of key offices that impact the student veteran experience, including academic advisement, the certifying official, disability services, the bursar, financial aid, registrar, the counseling center, and the career services center. We are also very fortunate to have uh, the Project for Return and Opportunity in Veterans Education, Project PROVE, currently on many of our CUNY campuses. PROVE assists student veterans in their transition from military life to college and civilian life. Teams of student veteran mentors, graduate social work interns, and social work field instructors work with campus professionals to enrich existing services to veterans. And my colleague, Leora, will speak more richly to Project Prove and its impact. Many soldiers, Marines, airmen, and sailors uh, join the military before their 21st birthday. And for many, it's the only job they've ever held. While this training and experience are certainly invaluable, it's not always intuitively translatable to civilian employment. In addition, many returning veterans face structural barriers to employment, causing veterans to struggle in their transition to the civilian workforce. CUNY is committed to helping student veterans successfully transition to the civilian workforce. Career readiness, internships, and postgraduate employment for student veterans are top priorities for our university. CUNY partners with both the public and private sectors to cultivate opportunities for student veterans. We connect our student veterans to valued organizational partners that, through mentoring programs and career counseling, help prepare student veterans for the world of work. American Corporate Partners connects veterans to business leaders through mentorship and online career advice. Edge for Vets assists veterans with transitioning their military service into resiliency tools for success. And Four Block assists veterans in bridging the gap from academics to career development. In closing, I'm very pleased to report that in, for 2017-2018, the College of Staten Island was named the top military-friendly military friendly large school in America in recognition of its programs for veterans, members of the armed forces leaving military service, and their military spouses by Victory Media. Again, we thank you for this opportunity, and I'm pleased to turn to my colleague, Lisa Biapa. Thank you. Good morning, Chairs Barron and Deutsch, and members of the Higher Ed, Education, and Veterans Committees. My name is Lisa Biapa, and I am the University Director of Veteran Affairs for CUNY. I am a proud veteran and graduate as well as CUNY, from CUNY. I'm grateful to have this opportunity to speak to you today about the initiatives and programs as well as our services here at CUNY. As a veteran of the U.S. Army, I take special interest in ensuring that our veterans, our reservists, our active duty, and even spouses and dependents reach their career, academic, and personal goals. In 2002, CUNY had only 1,200 student veterans. Today, we have almost tripled that amount with over 3,300 veterans. All of our undergraduate campuses have hired staff to make sure that we, to ensure that we uh, support this record enrollment of our student veterans across our CUNY system, which is within our city's five boroughs. Almost one quarter of our veteran student population are women. Almost three quarters of our student veterans are black, Hispanic, or Asian, much like the rest of our CUNY population. In 2011, to ensure that CUNY was responsive to the needs of our veteran population, CUNY convened a CUNY task force just on veterans, spearheaded by several college presidents with a mandate to customize an approach to veterans education. The veterans task force yielded 38 specific CUNY-wide recommendations in the following areas. 
accelerating veterans' access to financial aid benefits, creating a point of contact for each campus beyond VA benefits, offering expanded counseling services and advisement via Project Proof, facilitating credit transfer, initiating opportunities to engage with public and private sector internships, networks, and career opportunities. I am pleased to say that we, made, we have made a great deal of progress in all areas. Since 2013, our student veteran clubs have tripled from five SVA, that's Student Veterans of America chapters, to now 15. And since 2014, the university has updated its military policy to ensure that our student veterans can register and enroll in desired classes and process their GI Bill claims without wait without excessive delays. Some of our initiate, uh, our, sorry, some of our initiatives include um, waiving the admissions fee as stated earlier, as well as ensuring that eligible family members who do qualify for post 9-11 benefits do receive payments. Our central office of VA of Veteran Affairs is also responsible for coordinating outreach, retention program services, as well as ensuring that we have outreach to our students via social media where we have created a newsletter, a website that highlights our initiatives, as well as our military and veteran policies. Our office also hires student veterans through the VA program, and we have also ensured that our, we have platforms for outreach, as mentioned, as Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, as well as we profile our students, veterans, via a profile called Veterans of CUNY, similar to Humans of New York. CUNY has also established a CUNY-wide Council of Veteran Affairs in which we regularly meet two to three times a semester and some of our veteran directors are here throughout our campuses. At least 18 of our 25 veteran directors meet regularly. We also discuss federal and city policies as well as we bring in resources from New York City to support our veterans. We also have a close re working relationship with the Department of Veteran Services and other city agencies. Since 2014, we have held an annual awards breakfast just for our CUNY veterans with honors, geared specifically for current students who have achieved academic excellence and have a 3.5 GPA with 30 credits or more at the community level or 60 credits or more at the senior college level. We also host an annual professional development resource fair just for our students and as well as for our faculty to learn more about military cultural competency. Part of this fair is also to encourage our veterans to also know more about our CUNY programs, graduate programs, as well as resources within New York City. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on, on behalf of CUNY. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the City Council Veterans Committee and Higher Education Committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Leora Shadovsky. I'm a social worker, a proud graduate of Queens College and Hunter College School of Social Work, now Silverman. And I am currently the co-director of PROVE, Project for Return and Opportunity in Vet Veterans Education at Silverman School of Social Work. And I've been part of this initiative since 2008. My co-director, Dr. Roger Sherwood, is a Vietnam-era veteran and has worked with the veteran community in New York City for over 30 years. In fact, from 1986 to 2016, he was a clinical consultant to the Veterans Administration Hudson Valley Healthcare System Montrose Campus, where he counseled veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. In 2007, in response to the record number of veterans returning home and enrolling in higher education, an initiative was lost, launched from the CUNY Offices of Veterans Affairs and Enrollment Management. That initiative allowed Dr. Sherwood and then University Dean of Enrollment Management, Robert Tachik, a fellow veteran and a longtime veteran advocate, to establish PROVE, whose mission is to enhance existing services to student veterans on numerous CUNY campuses and support them in their transition from military service to college life and beyond. PROVE accomplishes this through an innovative service delivery model, utilizing graduate student 
social work interns, and experienced social work field instructors in conjunction with student veteran peer mentors and or VA work study students on these host campuses to assist the veterans in their transition academically, socially, and emotionally. And there's an attached diagram at the end of my testimony that visually shows you that. We are also pleased to have added training the next generation of social workers to be culturally competent in serving those who serve as part of our mission statement. Through this cultural competency training, we are able to provide student veterans with access to information both on and off campuses about services such as legal, medical, counseling, housing, et cetera. Who have started on just two CUNY College campuses, Hunter College and John Jay College, with two social work graduate interns placed at each and a placement at the then nascent CUNY Office of Veterans Affairs under the su supervision of Wilfred Cotto, who I think is here, um, that office's first director, who have started with a close collaboration with COVA that continues through today. Two years ago, when I last testified before this joint committee, we were going through, as a program, a contraction due to budget cuts and reduced our services down to only four campuses. Thanks to money allocated by the City Council Veterans Committee to CUNY in fiscal year 18 and 19, we have been able to build our program back up and are now serving more campuses than we had at our previous peak in 2015-16. We are very grateful for the support as we know the value of our model matches up with the needs of student veterans at CUNY especially during this time of waning public interest and dollars in the veteran sphere. Hoove over the years has expanded to other CUNY community and senior colleges. Um, we have a cohort currently of 19 graduate social work interns this year serving nine campuses and we will continue to be able to serve over 1,000 student veterans annually, unique student veterans annually. In fact, in 2017-18, Hoove served 1,015 unique student veterans and we were also able to report that persistence rates for PUV served student veterans last year was 95.9%, while non PUV served student veterans' persistent rate was 76.6. Still pretty good. One of the most valuable pieces of our program is utilizing the student veteran peer mentors, both paid and volunteer, as well as our social work graduate interns to help student veterans make critical social connections with other veterans on their campus. Their shared experiences and rekindling of a type of camaraderie that they may have had in the military and not since is a powerful tool in helping them transition from military life to college life and beyond. In shaping the project's service delivery model, Poov recognized that many veterans hesitate to seek formalized mental health services. Veterans may also be wary of what motivates civilians to offer their help. On the other hand, we have observed that veterans tend to relax in the presence of other veterans to more readily share their life experiences and to be inspired to help fellow veterans. As a result, Poov is co-located in campus student veteran resource centers. Sharing the space gives us a greater chance of success with fostering engagement with the student veterans as well as for them to find the opportunity to connect socially in the company of their peers. This trusting relationship builds a platform for Poov to provide concrete services to student veterans that aid in their educational success such as helping them navigate their educational benefits or offering sometimes academic support such as tutoring. Trust also allows us to offer emotional support and create linkages to other resources when necessary. We refer student veterans to professionals both on campus and in the community with whom we have developed relationships over the years and can personally recommend wherever possible. To that end, part of our work to exist, in, sorry, to enhance existing services on campuses to students, to student veterans, relies on creating a synergy around the various departments on campuses and the professionals who staff them, such as academic advising, counseling, accessibility and disability services, the registrar and the bursar's office. Hoove team develops relationships with the staff in these offices and the veteran knowledgeable points of contact who help to streamline administrative processes to serve the student veteran's needs better and more effectively. In a fast-paced academic setting, we find that the strengths-based approach better serves the student veteran who is likely to be busy or overwhelmed and can benefit from short-term practical support such as coping skills development and stress reduction techniques. For student veterans with more extensive need, Poov ensures that its team is informed and poised to respond. We have a mandatory bi-weekly psychoeducational and military cultural competency training for our intern cohort and our social work field instructors. Both the literature and anecdotal experience shows that there is a continued stigma around seeking help and services for most veterans. One of the reasons that the model works is because it meets student veterans where they are, at the campus in the Student Veteran Resource Center. 
Our student veterans have thrived and found purpose in assisting fellow veterans, a foundation of the military culture, and thus have helped themselves in the process. Many of our graduate interns have gone on to work with veterans either in their second year internship and or after graduation. More than 20% of our graduate interns since 2007-2008 now work at the VA, CUNY, and other veteran service organizations. One of the most valuable pieces of our program, I think I actually am looking at my own thing and I turned it over. Sorry, last page. I apologize. As I mentioned before, the public interest in funding for organizations working with veterans is on a downward turn. We need to be creative in reshaping the future of veteran services at CUNY. The fact that every CUNY campus has a staff person who is dedicated in part or full time to student veteran services is a tremendous achievement. But we cannot rest on that achievement alone and we cannot afford as a community and an institution of higher learning to lessen our focus and services. In peacetime, CUNY, as did many other academic institutions, allowed its services to veterans to shrink to almost nothing because of the drop in number of identified student veterans on campus. In 2009, CUNY experienced a 233% jump in veterans enrollment due in large part to the then new post 9 11 GI Bill, but also to the CUNY leadership, specifically COVA and the strong support from veterans within CUNY administration. Student veteran enrollment at CUNY may be at its peak now in the post 9 11 era. We may be seeing a plateau over the next few years, but not a diminishment. And with this time and experience behind us, we have a better idea of what kind of services beyond academic student veterans need to be successful at all educational levels, from the associate to the doctoral degree. I have been privileged over the last 10 plus years to work with veterans who have started at one of the CUNY community colleges and have successfully completed masters in education, social work, business, nursing, and more. Some of them are here in this room. Um, I also know that some of these veterans look at their experiences on campus and the communities and the resources that they found met their needs as a unique population, invaluable in their success, and I thank you for your time. Thank you so much. We appreciate the panel coming and offering the testimony on behalf of CUNY. And we've got lots of questions <laughs> for you, as you can imagine. Can you tell us what is your relationship with DVS? Currently, we work with DVS on the Veterans and Campus Initiative, as well as any initiative, for example, the rent the AH issue came up, but we also have resource fairs where DVS has been instrumental in preparing to have services and have um, resource individuals here to speak with veterans. Push the button again, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And I would just add that um, we're grateful to DVS and Commissioner Sutton and Cass to really help to galvanize uh, a citywide community around student veterans and the professionals who serve them. I think that we, we've always sort of informally relied on that network, but the affirmation that we've gotten has been a very powerful impetus for us to do better and to share best practices. Okay, how does CUNY identify uh, veterans as they enroll? Is it self-identifying? Is it part of the application process? How, do we, how does CUNY know we that veterans are enrolled? Sorry, we know primarily by self-identification, but we take it another step further. Once their benefits are cleared, once they have established through the VA a certificate of eligibility, we know that this is a veteran because of course, we don't just code them. We know through VA um, payments, et cetera, that this is a veteran. And do we have the information uh, regarding veterans that we can disaggregate? You know, I always like to have the particulars we so do. do we have that information? Could you share that with us? Absolutely. Okay, great. And we would want it, of course. Do you find that there's a concentration of veterans in a particular service area, in a particular curriculum area? We have veterans uh, that primarily at one point would major in criminal justice. We're also noticing a rise in STEM majors. That's a big trend that we're also noticing with our veterans. But it's all across the board, we have various majors, but I would say um, top 10 would be within the liberal arts, STEM, and possibly criminal justice. As well as business and finance. Say again? I'm sorry, business and finance as business well. Business and finance, okay. And we noticed that Prove is at, uh, what is it, nine campuses? How were those 
how were those campuses selected to be locations for Blue Visit Vibe? I guess, I guess I will answer that one. Um, some of them are historically, as John Jay and Hunter from the very beginning, uh, the program was established with those campuses. And for the other campuses over the years, it's both uh, to do with population size. So the very, very large campuses, um, I would include EMCC, John Jay, uh, and Kingsboro, actually, as, as kind of the, the large, on the large side for CUNY campuses in terms of student veterans. Um, but even the smaller campuses, such as Medgarvers, uh, where there is a desire to have additional services that can enhance what already exists on campus, if we have the right mix of interns and a good supervisor, then we can have a, a site there. So some of it depends on our resources from year to year in terms of uh, recruiting social work students from, from School of Social Work. Uh, and a lot of times it depends on the campus's willingness to, to host uh, our program and to allow our interns to grow in the first semester in their training so that they, they are uh, genuinely contributing members by, by mid fall semester. And does each location have the same level of services? From Prove? In terms of staffing, from Prove, yes. From yes. Prove. Mm -hmm. Okay, so wherever you would go, you would see the same. Yes. Okay, for, for, but I want to be very specific for, for Prove. Not every for campus. Prove, yes. Every campus is structured. That's a, what's such a unique thing about CUNY. That's okay. Every campus is just structured and how they, they set up their veteran services differently. So even the title of the, the person who is the task supervisor is going to be different from campus to campus. But two interns and a field instructor come with every, every site. And so how does CUNY engage the student uh, who is a veteran in the issues and concerns that are at the community, at the college, at the campus? How do, do you do a particular outreach to, to have them involved in that? That's why we have every campus having a campus coordinator. They can make direct outreach to our students. It varies according to what the issues may or may not be. Okay, and so CUNY is a signatory on the VA's Principles of Excellence program which established the eight guidelines. Uh, what progress has CUNY made in terms of following through on these principles? The principles um, of excellence, they follow through with what the President's Task Force recommends mm -hmm. as well. So I would say we've made great progress with that. And does the task force continue to meet? There's Unfortunately, no. Um, we, everyone knows that we are currently in a we have an inter interim chancellor, so that's one of the re that's the main reason. So when is the breaking news about the selection <laughs> of chancellor going to be? I wouldn't know. <laughs> Maybe you know something. something. No, I don't. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to the to the co chair. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in celebration of my first uh, hearing with uh, with the chair with Chair Barron. I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to take three questions from, two questions from advocates uh, for CUNY. So as soon as I get them, I will ask them. Um, so first, uh, I want to ask uh, Chris, um, how, is, how is CUNY um, dealing with the delays of the GI benefits? Um, I'm going to defer to my colleague, Lisa Biatha, who works in more granularity with those issues than I do, Lisa. Okay. So I'm with the NAFPA board, which is the National Association of Veteran Program Administrators. Um, since August, I was told with the new GI Bill, there might be delays. So I formally reached out to the university bursa at CUNY to ensure that none of our students have issues about registering for spring of 2019 or any delays in their fall registration. So this is ongoing, where we're ensuring that there are no academic enrollment issues for our veterans. So okay. would there ever be a case that you would tell a uh, student, I'm sorry, we can't take you to the, we haven't received any uh, benefits? No. no. Once so they're enrolled, once they're, they're fine. Once they're enrolled, they're enrolled. And they're let's fine. say they're not enrolled and they're coming in? Again, the benefits do not pay out automatically, so they can enroll. We do not delay enrollment for finances. So enrollment as that that uh, the veteran will enroll and actually attend and the classes. Attend, yes. So, so there's not, there won't be any delay no. for anyone to come. That's that's good to hear. Uh, thank you for that. Um, also, you oversee all 25 campuses. So, like, 
every campus has another veteran um, almost, liaison. Almost every campus. Again, um, our 18, I would say 18, 19 campuses are combined senior and community campuses. However, our professional schools um, do not have a high volume of veterans, so therefore there is a contact person, but not as formal as the undergraduate portions. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, this is Fol Foliora. Uh, what are the like the two top challenges? Like, if you could keep it brief, um, the two top challenges um, that you see that veterans have that for student veterans. Yeah, um, I think establishing community uh, because sometimes they can feel walking around a campus that um, they don't have any other people around that are like them, and so um, establishing community is one. And um, I think just getting used to the way that the colleges disseminate information and, and the rhythm that, that um, they expect students to respond in terms of registration, things <coughs> like that. It's just a little bit different from how people experience life in the military in terms of, of delivery of information. So that, that couple of months of transition can be uh, a rough one, kind of bridging the gap between what it is that they know from before and what it is that they're getting to know. So um, obviously you don't, um, you don't give all services to veterans. No. So what would happen when you reach out to a veteran or a veteran reaches out to you and the services that you do not provide, what do you do with information? Right. So we actually have a really good um, uh, referral network, which we've developed over the years. Um, and now that, uh, that VetConnect is up and running and, and relaunched, a lot of our interns are getting trained on that because I think that that's a really good resource. But between the vet centers, the VA, and other veteran service organizations, uh, around the city, we've been around for 12 years now and we've developed these relationships with warm handoffs to different agencies. So if something that we feel is it not appropriate for either an intern to handle or for something on, on the campus to be handled, we have this network in all the boroughs where we are. So when you connect a veteran to VetConnect, mm -hmm. you just you give them the website or you um, hold in my, in my experience with NYC yeah. uh, serves before VetConnect, yeah. we actually sat with the veteran. The veteran has to be the one that goes into the system, okay. but, but in an effort to be able to give that information to the next veteran that comes along, an intern will sit and say, hey, can I, can I just be with you while you're doing this so I can see what it entails so that we get the live information because we can't actually go into the system and, and do that. The veteran has to do that. Okay. All right, I'm going to ask uh, the two questions that I got. I'm not going to vet them. Uh, okay, question number one. <laughs> I won't vet them. Uh, how many veterans are enrolled uh, at CUNY and not receiving post 9 11 uh, GI Bill benefits? And what support are they offered? Any veteran that does not receive the GI Bill, we do have an Office of Student Financial Aid. So there is a way for them to get support that way if it's financial support. Um, if it's support in general, there is, again, any director on the campus that is the veteran coordinator or veteran director, they can assist that veteran. It's not exclusive to someone receiving benefits. They, so as long as they identify as a veteran, spouse or dependent, they will receive any type of assistance they need. So what experience, from your experience, what type of benefits did they receive if they're not part of the GI Bill? If they receive, if it depends on their um, financial score, there's a code in within FAFSA. If they reach 100% eligibility, then it's TAP and PEL. If not, it might just be TAP, might just be PEL, or they may be eligible for a Perkins loan, which is a lower interest loan, so it may vary but it's nothing veteran related that they'll receive if they're. Uh, is this something you do, Leon? Well, except for the fact that um, tuition deferral and, and registration is not dependent on them using particular benefits. In other words, if they identify as a veteran and they're coded as a veteran, they have the, the tuition deferral that someone that's using the GI Bill has as well. So that CUNY does not discriminate You know, if you're not using your GI Bill that particular year. There are people that are saving their GI Bill for uh, for graduate school or some people that are not getting 100% and may have maxed out. So the services that, that CUNY offers are not dependent on whether or not um, that you're using the GI Bill. It just, it happens to code you one way or another if you are. So if, if so again, if, the, if a veteran doesn't, is not, doesn't have a GI Bill right. and on the application they fill out, is there any questions about veteran, yes. like if they're uh, 
parents of Erin. Mm -hmm. is, is that part of the questionnaire? On the admissions application, yeah. it's there. So they can indicate that they're a veteran or if they're a walk-in, which is considered a direct admit, okay. they can state that they're a veteran. And so in other words, so if someone fills out, I'm a veteran, mm -hmm. and uh, he or she may say, oh, I'm, not, I'm not part of the GI Bill, but then would a question be asked, or is it on the application saying maybe they could get a, you know, the GI Bill transferred over to them mm -hmm. from a family member? It doesn't work that way. It's either they are or they aren't. So either way, as someone that's assisting them, whether it's in admissions or a veteran okay. coordinator, can assist them in receiving whatever benefits they qualify for. But so if a veteran doesn't know that, um, that you know, he or she is on, a, on the GI Bill, if they're unsure or they don't know, maybe they, maybe they might be eligible. So does someone look into that? Yes, that's what the veteran coordinators are there so for. And even if they okay. don't qualify, the veteran coordinator can assist them with a financial aid coordinator to help them find the ways to pay the bills without okay. worrying about enrollment. Okay. Um, question number two. Uh, please give us an update on what happened at LaGuardia Community College from the last hearing two years ago. Um, so at LaGuardia Community College, um, there were uh, some students and alumni who complained about uh, harassment and discrimination based on veteran status. And uh, pursuant to our approach to investigating those complaints, the college's chief diversity officer conducted an investigation. And while those concerns were not substantiated, it revealed that there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. And so we've been working with the college. They've restructured their veteran services office to make it more responsive to the needs and, and concerns of student veterans. There's been a real vibrance uh, that's been added through PROVE, um, which is very strong, has very strong presence now on that campus. And they've launched a vibrant veteran uh, student organization all of which means we're in the right direction. Enrollment is admittedly uh, a little down on that campus, but we have a sort of a strategic approach uh, to work at regaining the, the confidence of veterans in LaGuardia, and um, we're optimistic that, that we're beginning to, to move in the right direction. Okay. Uh, thank you. What is the average age of the veterans who come and participate in CUNY campus programs? Um, uh, in terms of the age of student veterans, they're, they're on average older than traditional college students. In fact, only 24% um, only of student veterans are age 18 to 24. 76% um, are 25 or older, and with 68% of them in the age range of 25 to 44 years of age. And we know that there's only 36 months of uh, GI bills that they are eligible for. How do, do we know how that impacts with their attainment of a degree? Do we know whether or not there are students who don't get that degree because their benefits are exhausted? I can't say specifics about numbers of students that have not been able to get a degree. Again, um, one thing about CUNY, we are the most affordable. So yes. once the GI Bill But you know, out, my position is yes. that CUNY should be tuition free. Sure. Oh, well. Okay. I want to get that on the record. That's true. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> back to veterans, um, the issue of 36 months doesn't usually impact them in a financial way as far as tuition because of the TAP and Pell benefits that cover tuition. The only issue is housing allowance. Once that's gone, then it makes it more difficult. And, and as an indicator to underscore Lisa's point, if we look at the three-year graduation rates of associate degree students, the same presumably 36-month period, mm -hmm. um, right. uh, our veterans uh, actually outperform the general student population in terms of graduation rates, graduating at 24% versus the general rate of 19%. So that's a good sign that um, at least they don't seem to be un dramatically unduly impacted by those. 
by this limitation. And the part of the uh, data that we have um, for veterans and military enrollment, at the senior colleges, it's a total of both full and part-time of 1,726. And at the um, community colleges, a total of 1,333. When we look at the graduate level, it's only 292 for senior colleges. And I don't see anything, uh, well, 292 at the senior colleges. So that's a, dram a dr dramatic difference. Do we have any idea? I heard someone reference the fact that sometimes veterans will use their other, we will use other sources mm -hmm. to pay mm -hmm. and reserve the GI Bill benefits for graduate school. Do we have any uh, indication of how frequently that's done? We have not been able to track that information, but what I have been doing is making outreach to the veteran coordinators and students to at least have the opportunity to find out more about our veteran uh, programs for veterans and spouses and dependents. And when I say programs, graduate programs. Um, I believe, and this is uh, just anecdotally, that a lot of our veterans assume that CUNY doesn't have certain graduate programs, or it might be that they have to take care of their families. But we're trying to get the word out more about our graduate programs. So is that something that Prove or the, uh, the veterans personnel on, on campus can do to be more aggressive in getting that information out so that they are all aware of the graduate programs that are out there? That's part of it, but I am also hosting uh, now twice a year a, de a professional development where CUNY has a special breakout room, and that's why I had those maps too, so that veterans and their spouses or dependents can be aware of what CUNY has to offer from the undergraduate to doctoral level. And now we know that Pathways is supposed to facilitate uh, mm -hmm. students moving from campus to campus. Mm -hmm. But not all classes are part of the Pathways program. Is there any effort to give special consideration to veterans who are transferring from one campus to another whose class credits may not fall within what's already within the purview of Pathways? It shouldn't be any different for veterans. Um, we, what we try to establish, because we have a smaller population than the quarter of a million plus CUNY students, we try to pick up the phone and speak to that new campus that the veteran is going to. Make sure our veterans start preparing to transfer before they physically get on a campus so that they're aware of any nuances. But those issues don't usually come up in large numbers. And uh, a question that had been presented before was about interruption in continuity of taking classes. What happens if a uh, reservist is called up and it's mid-semester and there's a break in, in their classes? CUNY just updated, well not just, it's almost three years now that CUNY updated their military policy. So no veteran that is called up should owe a bill or have issues about disruption. The only issue that may come up if it goes beyond a certain number of years, then you may have mm -hmm. issues there. But in general, no. We, CUNY has already established that any veteran that's activated, reservist, and so forth can have a bill cleared. They're, they're not responsible depending upon what time they were activated or called up for duty, and they are also insured to come back and the campuses work with them with their academic program. Okay, thank you so much. We do appreciate your thank coming you. and uh, offering the testimony that you have, and we look forward to getting the answers that we pose that you'll send to us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Barron. Thank you, and we hope you come back.
Uh, next panel, uh, panel, Joseph Berkman. Green, Joseph Berkman, Green. Uh, Angel uh, Basquez. Uh, Peter Orn. We have uh, another hearing um, coming up in here in this room pretty shortly, so we're going to put everyone on a three-minute clock. Um, and I really want to thank you for for coming down here today to testify. Okay, we'll go clockwise and we'll begin. Chair Deutsch, Chair Barron, council members and staff, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak to the Committee on Veterans and Committee on Higher Education regarding veterans' access to higher education in New York City. My name is Joseph Berkman Breen and I am a legal fellow in the Special Litigation Unit at the New York Legal Assistance Group, NILAG. In this testimony, I will discuss some of the specific challenges our clients face and the risks of for-profit post-secondary education and the ways in which current oversight is failing to prevent harm to student veterans. First, we see too many student veterans attending high-cost, low-value schools that lead them to exhaust their veterans' education benefits and burden themselves with loans, but that provide them little or no value in return. These high-cost, low-value schools are often for-profit schools which charge significantly more than public schools, spend significantly more on profit and advertising than they do on instruction, and have, on average, the lowest graduation rates, lowest employment rates, and highest loan default rates among all post-secondary post schools. In fact, students who attend for-profit schools for associates or bachelor's degrees experience, on average, declines in their earnings and rates of employment compared to before they enrolled in the for-profit school. Among student veterans who attend for-profit schools in New York City, we see low graduation rates, wasted education benefits, crippling debt burdens, and schools that do not provide veterans with any additional skills or job prospects. One of our veteran clients, Carter, attended Sanford Brown University, a now defunct for-profit school, for a medical billing and coding program. Attending Sanford Brown was so costly that Carter needed to take out loans in addition to relying on his VA education benefits. Sanford Brown told Carter that if he graduated, he was essentially guaranteed to find a job in his chosen field and the school would provide him lifetime career services support. As the New York Attorney General documented, these promises were false. Carter graduated with the highest grades in his class and applied to dozens of jobs, but he was unable to find work in his field. The school did not help him at all and it closed less than two years after his graduation, leaving Carter with nothing but debt. Carter exhausted his hard-earned education benefits attending a for-profit school that provided him no value, and he was unable to pay back his loans as a result. He is now on the brink of default and has left New York for a low-paying work in another state. Another of our veteran clients, Anthony, was disabled as a result of his military service and received an honorable discharge. In search of greater career opportunities in civilian life, Anthony enrolled in an undergraduate degree program at DeVry University, a for-profit school in New York City. DeVry told Anthony that his GI Bill education benefits would cover the cost of attendance, but that he should also sign up for what they called grants, just in case. Anthony, Lee, Anthony explicitly told DeVry that he did not want to take out loans. But after graduation, Anthony learned that he had been signed up for thousands of dollars of loans that he is now financially unable to pay back. Carter and Anthony's stories are classic examples of what our veteran clients experience at for-profit schools across New York City and illustrate the ways for-profit schools often engage in false advertising, deceptive recruitment tactics, and predatory lending practices to entice veterans to enroll. I've included more in my testimony about what Chair Barron raised earlier about the federal law, the 90-10 rule, that incentivizes for-profit schools to target veterans, and also the ways in which the federal government has failed in its oversight of for-profit schools. 
and I'd be willing to answer any questions on either of those topics. Thank you. Thank you. Very important. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chairman Deutsch and Chairwoman Barron, for allowing me to testify. Uh, my name is Peter Ahn. I'm professor of Islamic religion and comparative religion at Columbia. For over 20 years, I was dean of the School of General Studies, which is Columbia's college for returning and non-traditional students. Currently, I am the chair of the advisory board of the Columbia Center for Veteran Transition and Integration. Uh, in 1947, because of the influx of thousands of veterans to the Columbia campus, Columbia created a new liberal arts college called the School of General Studies, whose mission was to recruit, advise, support, and educate students with untraditional backgrounds, especially the veteran community. Uh, so where Columbia College recruits traditional students, GS recruits non-traditional students, but both communities are mainstreamed into the identical undergraduate program. So they're in class together, they take the same courses with the same faculty, they're held to the same high standard. In early 2000, we began once again to reactivate our veterans program at GS. Uh, in the beginning, it was a lot of trial and error, where do you go, building relationships with the military, and the Montgomery Bill at the time provided minimal support. So by 2008, we had 59 vets. With the advent of the uh, post 9 11 GI Bill in 2009, uh, in the 2017 2018 academic year, we had 493 undergraduate veterans. There are about 750 all told on campus. The challenges, however, for highly selective private schools is that, in fact, Columbia is an outlier. The higher up the food chain of selective schools you go, the fewer veterans you're going to find. One of the challenges is the admissions process, which is designed almost exclusively uh, to examine metrics based on a high school student's record. So it's your, uh, your test scores. It's your rank in your class. It's your, uh, the, the extracurriculars you've done. So if you come in as a 25-year-old veteran, as an applicant, and you have a strong but not dazzling high school record, you're out of the system. It's a one-size-fits-all model, which makes it nigh on impossible for the majority of veterans to achieve access into highly selective schools. We were lucky at Columbia by having GS, we were able to create a completely different and holistic set of metrics to evaluate students where they are in their lives. Uh, so we look at the high school record, but we're able to emphasize what has a veteran achieved during her time in the military. And uh, we find that many of them have achieved extraordinary, extraordinary things. And we look for actual academic performance. Uh, so the admissions issue is critical in dealing with private schools. Next is recruitment. Private schools go to high schools to recruit. Uh, for an untraditional student, you have to learn to engage community colleges. We have a, a deep, deep relationships across the country with highly sophisticated com community college programs, where frequently you're going to find veterans. And veterans, in fact, should be encouraged to test the academic waters at a community college. And if they excel, then they're ready to look broadly at a four-year education. Also engaging the military, building the relationships that will allow you to access transitioning veterans as they are, in fact, going through the process. Finally, there is uh, really the cultural, social, and support system. Uh, you need deep and engaged advising. Health services and psychological services have to be attuned to veteran students. Uh, there have to be academic support uh, systems that are robust and truly engaged students. Uh, and finally, uh, we've found it's essential to have skilled financial aid officers 
who can deal with the VA and manage all of the veterans' benefits. The less a veteran has to do with dealing with the VA, the more he or she is able to focus on their education. Uh, out of this has developed the Columbia Center for Veteran Transition and Integration because we're not going to have 5,000 veterans on the Columbia campus. And so it's an attempt to reach out broadly to the country and to the 200,000 veterans who are cycling out every year to give them the tools to transition from the military to education, education to the workforce. And so our first MOOC, as Commissioner Sutton mentioned, is University Studies for Veterans, which was developed really based on a course we require of all incoming GS students. It's basically learning how to learn all over again, since so many of our students have a break in their education. The next is working with Four Block, which was mentioned before, which is perhaps the most effective career readiness program. We have put Could you repeat that, working with, I didn't hear you. Four it's called Four Block, it's one word, F-O-U-R, then capital B-L-O-C-K. It's uh, one of the most, and I would say perhaps the most successful career readiness program. We helped put all of their 36-hour curriculum online, create a train-the-trainer module for them, and now the next iteration was we launched this month uh, Four Block Online, bringing together incredible luminaries in uh, the workforce world, transition world, to really be the instructors for this course online. The next uh, MOOC, which will appear in the spring, is Attaining Higher Education. What kind of decision-making process must a veteran go through to try to determine what is going to be best for them? Uh, we want them to find the right place to complete whatever kind of educational trajectory uh, they, they envision for themselves. And then to have mentors and uh, student mentors who will help them through the admissions process and advise their student affairs advisors who will then mentor the application through the admissions process at the various schools. We're also very involved with the Department of Defense. Uh, we helped launch the Veterans in Higher Education Initiative Collaborative, uh, which brings together about 40 colleges and universities from around the country to ask these same questions about veteran transition. Uh, we're also charter members of Veterans on Campus, uh, we work with lots of VSOs and uh, other veterans organizations. So it's a little more than three minutes, I apologize. <laughs> We're not counting. <laughs> Good. It's very informative. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, good Good afternoon, Chair Barron and Chair Deutsch. Um, my name is Angel Boskus, and I actually want to provide um, a student testimony. Um, I'm a full-time student at Lehman. I'm also a VA work study at the Office of Veteran Affairs at Lehman College. So um, I came to Lehman in the fall of 2017 as a transfer from Monroe College, and I had just had my first daughter a few months prior, and I was separated from the military in 2016. Um, so originally when I got out of the military, I went to Monroe College. Uh, I finished my degree in uh, medical administration, and then I decided to go to Lehman after I had my daughter. Um, it was difficult. I was also switching benefits, so I don't use post 9-11. I use uh, Chapter 31 voc rehab. And um, that was one of the problems that I had at Monroe, and I didn't find out about that until I wanted to go to Lehman. Um, so I had a problem with my application where I submitted in for a fee waiver, um, and for some reason, I guess my email just got lost. And by the time classes came to start, um, I still hadn't know if I'd been accepted to Lehman yet. So I decided to call CUNY Central, and immediately they got on it. They found my application. They waived all fees. And by the end of the week, I was already picking my classes. So that was amazing. They expedited my process when originally it takes six to eight weeks to process. So um, after that, uh, I was kind of, I had to get the ball rolling as far as uh, selecting classes, uh, figuring out what I was going to do since I was on such a time crunch. Um, I immediately went to the veteran's office uh, down at Lehman, and uh, I met with the director, Luis Soltero Rodriguez. And we sat down and we figured out a plan uh, that was kind of more tailored to me because I had an infant. My daughter was only five months at the time. Um, so instantly I got my help and I managed to get everything done in one day. Um, they made everything easy for me uh, and they showed a lot of support. I didn't really know how I was going to do this, um, but I ended up actually throughout the semester just bringing my daughter to class with me. 
which was great because um, most of my professors didn't even bat an eye. I had my infant with me in class throughout the whole semester and I was able to succeed that way. So everybody at Lehman made it easy for kind of for me to go in. When I finally got my footing that semester, the following semester I decided to apply for VA work study. Um, and I ended up working right in the office with veterans. So firsthand I was able to see um, the problems that veterans have. I was able to learn a lot under the director's tutelage. It was amazing and I'm actually still uh, working there right now. So um, they, everything has been great support wise. Um, there's always an opportunity. If there's a question that you need answered, you can go to us and get it answered. And if we don't know the answer, we will go get the answer. We'll sit down and we'll find it with you. Um, the s we utilize the space the best we can. I actually just had another baby two months ago and um, the office has been great as far as working with me with my schedule. Um, on campus, we only have one lactation room uh, and the lack of off, uh, office space in general, it's on the far side of the campus. We've done our best to kind of utilize that space so I can do what I need to do and still stay at work. Um, so it's everything about the office has been supportive as far as veterans go. There are veterans out there that do have post 9-11 and don't get covered 100%. So we offer every single um, information available for them as far as not just financial aid, what if they need to use VTA, which is veteran tuition assistance, but it's not available um, during the winter, which is optimal because it's an accelerated course of only three weeks. So state aid doesn't cover that and there are a lot of uh, veterans that don't want to use their GI Bill benefits for just those three weeks. Um, so we inform them on all the things that they can do. If, they, if they're not eligible for post 9-11, um, we inform them, hey, if you have a disability rating of 20% or more, go to voc rehab, which is where I'm at right now. Um, so everything, um, the limited amount of space that we use, we use it to, for students to study, for students to come, if they need to get a minute away, if they need to speak with the director about any problems they have with certification, everything goes on in that office and it's such a small space, but we maximize it the best that we can. We, this semester, got the Veterans Club up and running, so we're trying to establish that brotherhood and camaraderie that we all love so much about the military, we're trying to get it back, and we've had a successful turnout with all events this semester. Um, so that's um, everything that Lehman has done for me, and there's, there are some things that need to be improved upon, but uh, personally, my testimony is that they've been nothing but helpful towards my education. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're over time, but I just want to comment briefly. I want to thank CUNY Central for facilitating you getting in, acknowledge them. We beat them up often, so we want to acknowledge when they do their job. And I want to thank you for sharing. Uh, I will read your testimony in full because your, the university was highlighted as one that's at the top. And I appreciate the fact that you have alternatives to deciding who will be able to be admitted I think that's very important. And it gets to the point of my position for the single test that's used in New York City for their elite schools. It supports what I talk about, uh, other kinds of criteria. And yes, we hope that the uh, federal government will be more uh, select and perhaps decide that there are some institutions that should not be on the list to be included because of the violation of what they do and the poor results that they get. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I just want to, um, now I know why your name is Angel. Um, and it's really nice to hear that story, especially during the holiday season. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really, I, I got chills down my spine. So I want to thank you, uh, everyone for testifying. We have one more panel here. So yes, one more panel. So don't go away. <laughs> and then we'll go on commercial break. Hold on. Our next panel, um, Coco. Come on down. Uh, Samuel uh, Mullock. Hannah uh, Stinaway. We'll start with Hannah. Yeah, we're going to be, yeah, so people are waiting um, for this room here. Chairman so, Deutsch and Chairwoman Barron, distinguished members of the committee on behalf of Iraq and Afghanistan, Veterans of America, 
and our more than 425,000 members. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify here today on the pending legislation. My name is Hannah Sinaway, the Chief Services Officer with IAVA's Rapid Response Referral Program, or RIP for short. RIP is IAVA's high-tech, high-touch referral service for veterans and their families with a complete and comprehensive case management component. To date, we've served over 9,000 veterans and family members and over 1,000 veterans and family members in New York City alone, providing critical support and resources to ensure this city's veterans' needs are effectively met. Defending the GI Bill is an extremely important part of our work and is highlighted in our big six priorities for 2018. According to our most recent member survey, the post 9-11 GI Bill is an extremely popular program. 90% of our members have used, planned to use, or have transferred the benefit to a qualifying dependent. Out of the vast amount of our members that have used the post 9-11 GI Bill, 74% said they had a good or excellent experience. IABA led the charge in 2008 to pass the first post 9-11 GI Bill. Our leadership in 2008 to spearhead this landmark legislation was extremely important. For the next decade, IABA fought for and defended the post 9-11 GI Bill from advocating for the post 9-11 Veterans Educational Assistant Improvements Act passed in 2010 to defend the GI Bill against cuts in taxes in 2016 and 2017 and passing sweeping new improvements to ben the benefit in the Harry W. Colmery Veterans Educational Assistance Act, otherwise known as the Forever GI Bill. Additionally, 88% of IEVA's members believe that the post 9-11 GI Bill is either extremely important or important to transitioning service members, and almost 90% oppose any cuts to the benefit, which is why IEVA's continued effort to defend the GI Bill from cuts, waste, and abuse will last long into the future. In August 2017, with the backing of IAVA and many other veteran service organizations, the Colmery Act was signed into law, marking one of the largest expansions of veteran educational benefits since the original GI Bill in 1944. This expansion created a need for updated IT infrastructure within the VA to address new provisions in the law, such as modified monthly housing allowance payments. According to the legislation, the VA had a deadline of August 1, 2018, one full year after passage. To implement these changes, and as of this hearing, the VA has yet to do so. On October 10, well into the fall semester, the VA publicly acknowledged longer than normal processing times on their website and gave instructions for students who were experiencing financial hardship, such as falling behind on rent, utilities, or other important bills. On November 15th, the VA testified in front of the House Veterans Affairs Committee on these pressing issues, but representatives of both parties didn't appear to get the answers they were looking for. Since then, the VA has decided to delay implementing the revised MAH under the Colmery Act until the spring of 2020. Until then, student veterans will continue to be paid under the old MAH rates while the VA works to upgrade their IT infrastructure to comply with the new law. In the past couple of weeks, our rapid response referral program has received more than 20 inquiries from veterans reaching out reporting that due to lack of GI Bill payments, they are now facing serious financial crisis, including eviction, lack of food and clothing, transportation challenges, and utility shutoffs. Across the country, because of these delays in payments, many veterans are now facing significant challenges that directly threaten their livelihood and well-being. As we head into the spring semester, we ask the DVS to be extra vigilant for student veterans facing financial distress. While the VA has worked to clear delay delayed payments, the entire community needs to remain alert to ensure that this problem does not repeat in the future. Members of the committee, thank you again for this opportunity to share IAVA's views on these issues today. Oh, no worries. Thank you very much, Chairwoman. Good afternoon, and thank you to both chairs and the committees for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Samuel Mollick. I'm the Director of Policy and Legislative Advocacy for the New York City Veterans Alliance, member-driven and grassroots policy advocacy community-building organization that advances veterans and their families as civic leaders. On behalf of our members and supporters, we state our firm support for Intro 1047, and we applaud the public advocate in this committee for introducing and supporting this bill. 
that ensures that our city resources are used to protect veterans from predatory for-profit institutions that seek to exploit their hard-earned educational benefits without providing the high-quality education and support they deserve. This is a nationwide problem that our current presidential administration has only sought to further deregulate. And we need for city government to step in with solutions. We strongly urge this committee to pass and implement intro 1047 without delay. When public advocate Tish James introduced this bill last July, our founding director, Kristen Rouse, a veteran of the war in Afghanistan who herself used the GI Bill to earn her degrees, stated that it was more important than ever to root out bad actors preying upon the more than 12,000 student veterans in our city, attempting to use the rich educational benefits that they've earned. Advocates have fought hard in recent years to expand, protect, and defend what is now the forever GI Bill. But these benefits seem to be continuously in peril, even as we still have troops fighting and losing their lives in our nation's ongoing wars, whether it is delayed GI Bill payments because of VA failures at the federal level, or predatory bad actors exploiting benefits locally, student veterans need every measure of support and advocacy that our city can provide. Even as I speak, two New York City Veterans Alliance members are meeting with members of Congress on Capitol Hill alongside the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America to demand accountability on recent failures in getting student veterans the payments due them and to defend the GI Bill, in addition to other vital concerns for New York City veterans. I will tell you what they are telling our congressional delegation. The time to act is now. In a report released just this month, the VA's own Inspector General estimated that $2.3 billion could be going to for-profit schools without proper ac academic accreditation because of massive oversight failures. It has been well documented over the past decade that for-profit institutions target veterans for their GI Bill benefits, saddling student veterans with debt for degrees that too often can't be used for the careers that they were promised. In a 2014 U.S. Senate report, it was documented that 66% of veterans who attended for-profit colleges using GI Bill of benefits left that program without a degree. And as the chairwoman had already brought up, I'll, I'll skip the part of my testimony detailing the 90-10 rule. But I will say this, in 2011, a senior official at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau wrote in a New York Times op-ed that this loophole gives for-profit colleges an incentive to see vet service members as nothing more than dollar signs in uniform and to use aggressive marketing to draw them in. Correctives passed under the Obama administration have been repealed under the current administration, av as have ethics rules at the VA that otherwise brought some measure of accountability, particularly conf uh, conflict of interest uh, statutes that would have uh, prohibited VA employees from being able to be employees at the same time of for-profit institutions. The federal government simply is not providing adequate safeguards and accountability to ensure student veterans receive a quality education in return for the GI Bill benefits they've earned by putting their lives on the line for our nation. We need our city government to st step up for veterans with the vital support and protections that Intro 1047 would provide. With VetConnect NYC, a robust staff of outreach specialists, and consistent connectivity with city and state agencies, the NYC Department of Veteran Services is best prepared to serve as a hub of information and resourcing for the latest in veteran educational benefits, best practices, and identification of institutions that are not meeting their obligations to our student veterans. This is substantive action that is needed now. We urge this committee to pass the bill without further delay. As our founding director, Kristen Rao, stated at the bill's introduction last July, quote, veterans need support and resources in order to su succeed. Our city government must marshal all available resources to root out bad actors profiteering off of the benefits rightfully earned by veterans. On behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Pending your questions concludes my testimony. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thank Kristen. Samuel. Uh, Samuel, I'm sorry. Yeah. Just making sure you're listening to me. <laughs> Paying attention, good job.
Hi, I'm Coco Culhane. I'm the founder and director of the Veteran Advocacy Project, and we provide uh, free legal services to low-income veterans and their families. I will keep this very short. I just, I was surprised today at the lack of attention paid to certain challenges that student veterans face, and I have never heard of a veteran being eligible for the post 9-11 GI Bill and not knowing it, ever. I mean, I, you know, and I think it's important to speak to the people who are working in those offices and the CUNY offices and who are working with the vets and they're the ones who really know what's going on and know what the problems are. Uh, unfortunately, in my position, we see people when things go wrong, right? So my perspective is always very negative. <laughs> um, but what I will say is that so many New York students are not on the post 9-11 GI Bill. They're on food stamps. They are struggling like a lot of other New Yorkers um, to juggle, you know, job, school, kids, all of it. And that is a huge population in, amongst student veterans, right? And so today really I feel like is focused on the post 9-11 GI Bill and there are challenges there too, but really when things start to go wrong, no matter what your funding source is, no matter if you're at a for-profit or non-profit school, things start to go wrong and those debts start stacking up. And that's what we see and you know that's where the people who are working in these offices are so important and they're so key to reaching those student veterans and sending them to places like IAVA to VAP to NILAG to all kinds of you know to get them connected so that they can stabilize and seek the treatment that they need you know whether or not it's just an overwhelming transition or it's actually someone we ha we had a student who came back from war and had, you know, I'm not a clinician, but it was very clear, had severe PTSD and had failed out of a CUNY school and was using that roughly $4,000 a month to support his undocumented family and was then owed money back to the VA. Like the challenges just stack up. And I think that that's a reality that didn't quite get touched on enough today. I think it's, it started to with, um, and I, I feel bad, I'm not a veteran, I shouldn't be speaking to this, but I just really wanted to highlight it, that those, are the, those challenges are out there and they're important. Thank you, Coco, and, and uh, thanks for your testimony. And um, as you know, the, the, the non-for-profits are crucial yeah. um, for our veterans and they all do an, an, an amazing job. And uh, when, you do, when you do work, um, even if it's once a day, send out some sh social media to let New York City and let the world know what you do every, every single day on behalf of our veterans. And uh, we're gonna keep on pushing for additional funding. Um, the next budget, uh, we were able to raise it uh, um, to an additional million, and that's with the help of my colleagues. And uh, so, you know, let's, let's let everyone know of the work that you guys, you guys do each and every day. So sending it out on social media, bringing awareness is very important. So finally, I just want to thank each and every one of you uh, for coming out today. I know some of you are off the clock, and that's very important when you come here and um, an advocate on behalf of our veterans. Uh, God bless the United States of America, and uh, happy holidays to everyone. And uh, we hope that the new year approaching, that we only see good things and uh, and together with the help of the advocates and, and my colleagues and New Yorkers, uh, we hope that we'll bring additional help to our veterans. And if you see a veteran out in the street, don't hesitate, um, call 311. And uh, let's uh, make sure we have a, a beautiful and successful year ahead, 2019. Thank you. Uh, uh, we are now adjourned.